hearing on the city's 2024 proposed operating budget for the Housing, Homelessness, and Building Committee, as well as the Health, Human Services, and Equity Committee, which is chaired by Councilmember Melissa Green. This week, we are experiencing some of the coldest nights with temperatures dropping into the single digits and additional snowfall expected over the next few nights. Tonight's conversation around housing and homelessness is timely and important. Housing is absolutely a human right. All people deserve to have a safe, stable, and affordable place to call home. And it is our responsibility as policymakers and public officials to work towards achieving that vision. Columbus is experiencing a period of rapid growth and change. How we approach housing must adapt to ensure we can uplift all of our residents, especially those who are traditionally left behind. I am proud of Council's efforts over the last year as we announced and passed a comprehensive housing policy package intended to advance a variety of legislation, supporting pathways out of poverty, protecting tenants' rights, and ensuring access to safe housing. I am also grateful and proud of the work each of the departments we will hear from tonight have done to continue supporting our residents. Whether it has been answering the call to safely rehouse residents facing uninhabitable conditions, deploying dollars to keep our residents safely housed, or finding creative ways to support our nonprofit organizations, I am proud of the work being accomplished each day. I truly believe that by reinvesting in our community, our people, and our nonprofit organizations, we can begin to move the needle towards a city that supports each and every one of our citizens. Thank you to Mayor Ginther and the City of Columbus staff for their dedication and hard work in 2023. This year's budget is our largest budget in, city, in our city's history. The total resources for this budget, which is comprised of the Auditor's General Revenue Fund, estimate plus a transfer of $30 million from the Basic City Services Fund equals $1.1 million. Using this total dollar amount, the departments are tasked to build their proposed budgets for the year. Tonight, we will first go through the proposed budget for the Housing, Homelessness, and Building Committee, where we will hear presentations from the City's Department of Development and Department of Building and Zoning Services. And then Council Member Green will lead on the second portion of the hearing, in which we will go through the proposed budget for the Health, Human Services, and Equity Committee. We will hear presentations from the City's Department of Development, Celebrate One, and Columbus Public Health. Each department will present an overview of their 2024 proposed budget and take questions. I want to thank and acknowledge our invited presenters this evening, Director Scott Messer from the Department of Building and Zoning Services, Director Mark Mike Stevens from the Department of Development, Assistant Health Commissioner Anita Clark with Columbus Public Health, and Director Danielle Tong and Melinda Cunningham from Celebrate One for their ongoing commitment and leadership and for taking the time to present on their respective department budget proposals. Following presentations from the department this year, we will also have a few invited speakers from the community that will discuss their work and the impact of the budget. Following that, members of the public will have the opportunity to provide testimony. Before we jump into presentations, I'd like to uh, turn the podium over to Council President Harden and then my um, co-counsel this evening, Council Member Green. Council President Harden. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the uh, co-chair and council members for being here. Thank you to the mayor's administration uh, and certainly the community for being here for an uh, important conversation. Uh, we say that uh, a budget uh, is our city's values uh, written down. And so today we're uh, here to talk about um, housing, homelessness and building zoning, and then public health, human services and more. I think these things are all connected. They're all connected. Uh, I'm going to defer to the leadership of Chairs Faber and Green as we go forward, but I wanted to get started today uh, by sharing an experience that I had just yesterday. Um, as we, and I, before I say the, what, I went, what, what I experienced yesterday, one, it's not anything new to so many people. Um, I, as a council member and city council president, view the issues of homelessness, homelessness normally through a 30,000 foot view. And I know that a lot of providers view it up close and see it every day. Um, but I don't think that we should be desensitized from it. And I think it's good to have proximity with it. 
Um, and as we come off of Dr. King's holiday, where we taught ourselves and push ourselves to be uncomfortable um, so that we can be better, um, we, I'll share this story. Um, Yesterday, I visited two rec recreation centers that the city adv advised that the, to the media and the public on Friday would be open from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. They were Dodge Recreation Center and Linden Recreation Center. When I visited both, neither were open. The city put out notice saying that they would be closed on Monday, but I didn't see that notice. Uh, and unfortunately, neither did some of our city's residents. At one of those centers, I met a woman with her six-year-old daughter waiting outside one of the rec centers, shivering on a bench. The woman did not have a jacket. She was wearing three sweaters. Like me, she thought the center would be open, but it wasn't. So she had been sitting outside in 10 degree weather for hours, hoping and waiting for it to be open. Why was she there? Well, she had been staying at the Van Buren shelter since March of 2023. Van Buren asked folks to leave the shelter for a few hours every day as part of policy. She had nowhere to go except here. But when she got here to our front porch at the city, as far as I'm concerned, as I'm concerned, we let her down. It brings questions to me like why wasn't the rec center open? Second, why are we asking folks to leave the shelter when it's 10 degrees? Third, this woman has been at Van Buren since March 2023. In nine months, we have not been able to place her into any kind of dignified and safe and comfortable setting to live with her six-year-old daughter. And this is a woman with a minor who I believe are supposed to be prioritized in our system. And she has a son too, she told me. He's 16, but he's living with a friend on their couch. We put the woman in the car. We took her back to Van Buren. This, I think, is an example of our community collectively failing. Um, I'm sharing this story because I believe stories like hers are getting more and more common. I believe we are a big city now. We have big city problems. And it's time for us to have big city solutions to have a well-funded, well-structured, and well-organized, cohesive system of serving the unhoused. In today's conversation and going forward through this budget process, we're prepared to look for more funding, to ask for more coordination, to make sure that there are no divisions and responsibilities. And certainly this council will play our role and holding folks responsible, and as we hold ourselves responsible for these issues. Um, the good news is I believe that, I believe in Shannon Isom's leadership at the CSB. I believe in the work that Director Stevens is doing. I believe in the work of, that, Han, that Director Jones is doing. I believe that we have the tools. But we're gonna have to focus, we're gonna have to to address this issue, this issue uh, knowing that we can do better. I believe that we can. I think that these conversations today will help us move forward in that vein. So thank you so much for letting me share my story. Uh, the story, story of, I believe, uh, many in our community. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council President Hardin. Uh, Council Member Green. I don't know what more that I could say um, than the experience that our council president just shared that he had yesterday that would really make an impact um, better than I think the way that that story highlights the reality that many of our residents face on a daily basis. Um, the truth is, and many people in our community who have been experiencing hardship has known this, have known this for a long time. Many community advocates have known this for a long time. Social workers like myself have known this for a long time. Um, that our uh, community services system, our systems of support, um, is, it's not a system that's just uh, broken. It was a system that was never really built. And the great thing about that very unfortunate situation we find ourselves in is that we have the opportunity and the duty 
to do that now. Um, and if we've learned anything uh, from the years we lived during the COVID-19 pandemic and the years that have followed that since is that uh, our community is resilient, our community organizations are committed, and this city is committed to doing what it takes to build those systems of support. And so I am honored to be here today um, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be a small part of contributing to that very big work that we have ahead. Um, and I hope that um, you all will join us in that effort as well. Thank you, Council Member. We're also joined by two of our um, other colleagues. Council Member Remy, do you have any remarks you make this time? And Council Member Weish? All right. We will now begin with the presentations of the proposed budgets. We will start with the Department of Building and Zoning Services with a presentation from Director Scott Messer. Director Messer. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Favor, President Hardin, other members of council. Uh, I wanted to uh, thank you for the opportunity to um, be here today to present um, some information regarding our 2024 um, operating budget. I also have uh, Deputy Director Tony Celebrezzi with me as well. Um, I'm gonna start just by giving a, a couple of brief overview of the functions of building and zoning um, before I get into the actual detailed numbers. Um, building and zoning department uh, has a few distinct um, areas. The building part of building and zoning really focuses on permitting, plan review, uh, inspections, and compliance uh, all around building permits. Um, we do um, approximately 55,000 permits a year and conduct almost 100,000 inspections. So uh, we're by far the largest, uh, busiest building department in the state of Ohio and um, really proud of the work uh, that our folks do uh, with that type of volume. We also have zoning, the, the zoning part of building and zoning. Uh, they focus on zoning clearance. Every permit that gets issued has to go through zoning clearance to make sure um, that it's allowed to be permitted through zoning. And then we also have a large function around uh, zoning variances and rezonings that occur almost weekly here at city council meetings and in various other forums around the city. Um, and then we have uh, code enforcement, which is a separate division Code enforcement um, really focuses on the housing code and really uh, going out into our neighborhoods and dealing with a variety of complaints and violations that uh, are mostly reported through 311. Um, we do have a, a proactive code enforcement team or PACE team, uh, which does great work in the city, really focused on some of those larger problem properties like you've seen a lot and heard a lot about Colonial Village and other places such as that. Um, we also have folks dedicated to court activities, things like graffiti. All of our zoning code violations are handled by code enforcement. Environmental blight team uh, goes out and remedies some emergency hazards that might exist, uh, boarding up properties and so forth. Um, we also are gonna be adding in 2024 uh, a lot of activity around um, council member favor, some of your new housing initiatives. Um, some of the things that uh, we're gonna be doing around enforcement, um, partnering with legal aid and other folks. Um, not a part of our department yet, but coming soon in uh, 2024 in April, we will be adding licensing and weights and measures, which are uh, divisions out of public safety, which will be transferring over. You will not see that reflected in the 2024 budget, but I just wanted to highlight that that will be coming uh, after the first quarter. Uh, over to building and zoning services. Um, we uh, have a hybrid. Uh, some of our um, department, the building and zoning side, is all funded not through general fund dollars, but through what is called a development services fund or all of the permitting fees. So all of the fees that we collect annually from those 55,000 permits that I mentioned, all of those fees uh, go to support the activities of building and zoning. Um, code enforcement and soon to move over licensing and weights and measures, those will be general fund uh, supported agencies. Um, so my budget is a bit bifurcated between money that we're not pulling out of the general fund but is supported by our own dollars and then some of the money is coming out of the general fund to support code enforcement. Um, so with that, um, I'll just kind of highlight some of the overview numbers 
um, that we have. The uh, Building and Zoning or Development Services Fund that I just mentioned to you, um, that supports uh, about 190 uh, full-time employees and three part-time employees. That budget for 2024 uh, is total of $31,033,406. Um, so just over $30 million uh, goes out of the general fund to support all the activities of, uh, out of the development services fund to support the, all the activities of building and zoning services. Um, a lot of those, uh, most of 80% of those dollars go to support personnel. So $21.5 million approximately out of that 31 um, goes for personnel support um, and the folks that do all the work. Um, contrast that with our code enforcement budget. Our code enforcement budget is a general fund budget um, and our general fund subtotal uh, coming out of code enforcement is $7 million $753,396. Now what I would add is there's um, a, a, a portion of code enforcement activities that is funded out of the Development Services Fund. So the total budget for code enforcement is around $9.5 million. 1.7 of that comes out of the Development Services Fund. The reason for that is uh, primarily the zoning enforcement that code enforcement does. So it's a, a a little bit strange uh, how that works, but while I have a zoning section, they're primarily focused on the code related activities of zoning. When we have violations out in our community, uh, if we have uh, cars parked where they're not supposed to be or use uh, problems where people are using their property the way they're not supposed to, all of those violations are, inspect are uh, investigated by code enforcement and orders written by code enforcement. So we do support um, some of the dollars of our code enforcement officers out of the building and zoning fund. So all told for our department, uh, our 2024 budget is just over $40.5 million to support 193 employees in building and zoning and 69 in code enforcement. I do want to highlight just a couple of key things um, in our budget. Um, we are spending um, this year out of the Development Services Fund um, money, funds uh, for our zoning code update. I know a number of you have been involved in that and are aware of that, but we have um, funds set aside for that purpose. The advantage that the Development Services Fund has is we are able to keep um, a balance in that fund. Uh, so for example, during COVID when our numbers dropped substantially, but we weren't um, doing as many inspections, we were able to weather that storm uh, with, even though permits were way down and our revenue was way down, we had a, what would, I could only refer to as like a rainy day fund or a, a, a fund balance that allows us to make it through those kinds of times. It also allows us to fund initiatives like this zoning code update that we're doing. And we spend a lot of money on technology updates. Uh, we now do over 80% of our business completely online. Uh, so all of our permits are available online. We've um, scanned and digitized several million pieces of paper so that all of our archives are now um, available uh, digitally and in, into perpetuity. Um, we also uh, do um, most all of our uh, um, permits are available to be purchased online. Um, there's always going to be some folks who still come down and use our customer service center, but we've invested quite a lot of money in technology updates uh, in recent years. Um, those are our pri priorities. Um, I will say that um, when it comes to our um, fees, we did initiate a fee increase this year. Every five years we do uh, fee increases, um, which is... Uh, you know, it's unfortunate any time we have to up, up, uh, increase fees, but we try to spread that out to where we only do it once every five years. Um, we do a, a pretty strong analysis of our sister cities and other cities around the country. We spend uh, uh, a very large amount of time uh, calculating our fees and justifying our fees. We are well below most cities in terms of uh, comparable fees uh, around the country and especially in Ohio. And we compare ourselves to cities like Indianapolis and Nashville and Pittsburgh and a number of other regional cities as well as local um, uh, suburbs like Dublin and Grove City. Um, 
you know, nationally, the average, just to give you an idea, the average permits uh, can cost as much as 1% of the cost of construction of a project, and we're under a half a percent. So we're well under the national average, actually less than half of what the national average is for a typical large commercial permit. The other thing that we do is we try to keep our residential fees for residential projects as low as possible. Um, it's just a reality that our commercial friends can um, better withstand fee increases and, and um, we try to minimize the impact on our residential customers as much as possible um, when we do these types of fee increases. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that because we just, it literally today is the first day of that new fee schedule. So um, I just wanted to highlight that uh, because it only happens once every five years. Um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that any of you may have. Thank you, Director Messer. Uh, just a few questions from me and then I'll turn it over to uh, my colleagues. Uh, we are experiencing rapid growth in the city of Columbus, close to 40 folks a day uh, move into our community uh, do you expect any growth from our code enforcement team to accommodate for that growth? I do think um, there will need to be some expansion in our code enforcement team, not only based on the growth that you just mentioned, but um, several different initiatives. We have some uh, initiatives around the noise ordinance that was passed recently. We have the initiatives that I referred to earlier, um, some of your housing uh, enforcement initiatives, some of the new code provisions that have came out. So I expect there to be uh, at least a few positions added in the near term just for those, but I also expect on a more long-term basis um, that we'll have a need for more code enforcement officers. Code enforcement only, I, I can't really say recently anymore, but code enforcement transferred to my department uh, a couple of years ago from the Department of Development and we've been doing a lot of analysis. We've already converted a few positions from non-code enforcement officers to code enforcement officers. So we've added three code enforcement officers without an impact to the budget uh, since code enforcement was added to my team. Um, and we expect to continue to look at that, um, ways to just become more effective and efficient with the, the benefit of having building and zoning together with code enforcement. We've been able to become more synergistic and find out ways using my own compliance teams and some other creative ways to free up positions that we can now use for code enforcement officers. But I do expect that to be a, a, a priority going forward. Can you talk a little bit about the efforts to make sure that um, increasing our code enforcement officers is uh, kind of built around an, an equitable model of ensuring that there's diversity um, as relates to our code enforcement team? Uh, historically, uh, we know that in certain communities, code enforcement has been weaponized against individuals um, that uh, may not fit uh, the, the direction in which a neighborhood might be moving. And so we, we do know that this is a, a reality that many of our neighbors have faced. Um, so can you talk just very broadly about what our uh, engagement efforts look like uh, to increase the diversity of code officers? Sure. Um, we have actually uh, had the opportunity to hire many code enforcement officers uh, in the last 18 months. We've had two rounds of uh, several code enforcement officers that we've, that we've hired. I don't have the specific numbers in front of me, but we have definitely enhanced and increased our diversity uh, in those hires. Uh, we also have made it a priority uh, in our department just in general. We participate in dozens of minority job fairs and we partner with Ohio State uh, on a many occasions to handle a lot of um, recruitment efforts that we do. We partner uh, with civil service and other uh, entities to try to enhance uh, what we can do to become as diverse as we possibly can. Like you said, we serve a very diverse community mm -hmm. and so uh, we would like for our code officers to reflect that diversity um, and we have made that a priority. Uh, we do track our numbers. Like I said, I don't have them here in front of me, um, but we are uh, improving in that category across the board in the department, uh, both building and zoning and code enforcement. Um, we have uh, implemented a, a number of different um, programs in the department in general. I know you asked specifically about code enforcement, but I would highlight uh, a pretty extensive partnership that we started this year with the Fort Hayes Academy. Um, and uh, we uh, partner with their, their trades 
uh, section, um, and we have a pretty robust internship program that we started. Um, where we are hiring interns from there and then once they graduate we're actually hiring folks to become full-time inspectors with the building and zoning services department um, and Fort Hayes is uh, definitely represents a much more diverse population than we typically are drawing from so um, we're happy to partner with them and expect that to be an opportunity for us to have uh, a chance to become more diverse that's really good to, to hear, Director Messer. And I should have um, stated that this is the first committee hearing uh, with under the new structure for committees for city council. And so, um, so that folks are not confused, uh, this specific committee deals um, not with the zoning portion, the land use portion, uh, but specifically around building standards and processes. Is that your understanding, Director Messer? It is my understanding. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, along with the housing uh, portion that we get through code enforcement. Absolutely. Um, and so while we're here for just a moment, um, some of the feedback that we receive from, from folks out in um, our building and, and developing a community is um, the timeliness of permits uh, being issued uh, reviewed and things of that nature. Do you feel as though um, the process has been streamed on, streamlined uh, a lot uh, better for our our, um, our folks in this community uh, so that we can get projects online a lot quicker? Yeah, I'll highlight just a couple of things in response to that, uh, Chair Favor. First, I would say that uh, just being able to do things online has greatly enhanced our responsiveness and our timelines. For example, um, all of our inspectors carry mobile uh, phones and tablets that enable them to result inspections right on site. So of the 90,000 inspections that I mentioned to you, when an inspector goes out, uh, if they pass an inspection, they just click a box right on their phone and it's updated instantly in our system. Um, no more waiting around to see if your inspection passed or not. We have very strict timelines uh, mandated by the state as well as targets that we've agreed to with the industry under a memorandum of understanding and that really governs all of our timelines and we track those religiously so for example all of our inspections have to be scheduled and done by the next business day uh, so those 90,000 95,000 inspections that we did last year almost a hundred thousand um, we do over 99 percent of those by the next business day we have to track all of our building permit timelines. The state mandates those are done within 30 days. We track all of those religiously, and once again, we have targets of 90% or better, and we regularly run in the 95% range. Um, we also have timelines that govern almost everything that we do, and we track those on a, in a database and on a uh, uh, report that we give to the industry every month. Um, I, will, I will highlight that what we did last year Probably um, the two biggest uh, issues with the length of time that housing projects and sp specifically take is the zoning process that they have to go through can take some time and the what we call the one-stop shop or engineering process. That's where we route plans to like 13 different city departments to get input. So if you're doing work in the right of way, if you're doing utility work such as water or sewer, um, those all have to go to a variety of agencies around the city. That process also can take uh, quite some time. Um, we tracked those religiously to get some baseline data last year, and we launched two different project management uh, systems for housing projects. So we took all of our housing projects and we, we managed them through my department in a much more proactive way, assigned a project manager to every housing project that went through zoning. The average zoning time dropped from nine months to five and a half months last year. So we were I mean, that's a, you know, 40% reduction or more in how much time we got through the process. We also um, started a project management for the one-stop shop review. Um, and uh, through that process, we've been able to affect the timelines a little bit. But the bigger thing that we did is we initiated a brand new expedited review process, whereby for housing projects, we can get commitment from the developer partnering with us, signing off on an MOU regarding timelines, not only for the city, but for the developer to meet. And partnering together, the, um, we're looking to take that process and cut that in half as well. Um, and we have two projects. We just started that in 2024, so we have two projects that we're starting to actively go through that 
expedited review process, and I'm anxious to see how that plays out. Thank you, Director. Um, turning over to my colleagues for any questions. We might have. Uh, Council Member Weish. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Director Messer, for being here and kind of giving in this presentation. As a newer council member drinking from a waterfall, it's helpful to kind of hear directly from the departments about their budget and what they're doing in the community. I wanted to touch on just uh, a comment you made related to fee increases for residential um, homes. Um, as you know, you know, we have a number of people who are living on a fixed income, struggling to make ends meet already, and a code violation could be that straw that breaks the camel's back. And I'm just curious, can you speak to any assistance programs budgeted um, to help someone fix a, a violation? Yeah, I can tell you that development um, has a number of different programs that may be available for folks to do home repair and programs. We, as the regulatory agency, don't get involved so much in those kinds of programs, although we are um, starting to establish a variety of partnerships with folks. Um, we've been partnering with the um, Department of Diversity and Inclusion to talk about um, ways that we might uh, be able to help establish some sort of a grant fund uh, which would allow folks who can't afford our fees, our permit fees, to be able to um, maybe have access to dollars to just even just pay my fees. When it comes to actually doing the repairs and those kinds of work, like I said, those programs are mostly you know, through the development department and other agencies. But, but I do charge money for my fees, and those can be challenging as well, whether it's fees for rezoning or whether it's fees for actual permits that you need. And we're, we're trying hard to find creative ways to make sure that our, you know, folks who have a harder time affording just even my permit fees might have access to some grant dollars to do that. Appreciate it. Thank you for the mm -hmm. clarification. Councilmember Green. Um, not necessarily a question, but I did also just want to highlight and commend um, your team, especially your code enforcement teams, because in addition to the essential work that you do, you also um, are very intentional about integrating that work into our other city departments, like partnerships with public health or um, the Celebrate One initiative, for example, you know, code enforcement walks in and there's a need for a safe sleep place. And so I think, um, I think that, um, a, if I can support, you know, helping to increase those collaborations, um, but B, just want to thank you so much um, for being thoughtful about that work um, and those collaborations and how we can look at these issues holistically. Thank you, uh, Council Member. I, you know, I could mention um, a specific, we have a new initiative with the Health Department really around lead and some of the lead issues that are affecting um, our city. Um, and we've been really excited to be a pretty active partner around a number of different ways to help the Health Department with that initiative. So we're excited about our partnerships and really um, share your, uh, your pleasure at how well uh, it works to work with other departments around the city. And there truly is a lot of cross-department uh, collaborative efforts that are happening, uh, specifically just with this committee in and of itself. You mentioned lead director, but we have our health department who's also helping to steer uh, that, that issue for our residents uh, in Columbus. We have the Department of Development that's helping to uh, fill in some of those gaps with emergency repairs. Uh, so there is some um, connectivity here that helps, that I hope uh, provides a... Um, more streamlined and comprehensive service uh, to the residents in Columbus. Uh, Council Member Remy. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> Director, you know, I talk a little bit about the 311 process of, for code violations, first and foremost, because I think we don't really have the staff to proactively be going out necessarily. It's more driven by the residents. And I wanted you to point that out. I also talk about the hours that they that they work and I and then lead into what could be with noise um, enforcement officers as far as after hours or towards you know like an evening time frame when other issues do tend to occur 
Yeah, thank you, uh, Council Member Ramey, uh, for your question. I will, uh, as you said, clarify that it is true, the vast, vast majority of our code enforcement cases uh, and inspections and therefore orders come from 311 complaints. Um, but we do some proactive code enforcement. We have been able to um, do some sort of blitzes on some of our major thoroughfares uh, where we've gone along those corridors and written citations and looked for violations. We have uh, encouraged our code officers to, you know, not just be narrow sighted. If you go to a street on a 311 call and you see other similar violations, uh, let's not just turn a blind eye uh, to those as well. Um, you're right, uh, it's very challenging staffing wise to be extremely proactive uh, because we have our hands full just responding to the, the 311 calls as it is. Um, but uh, largely, um, you know, we do have a very involved community. Uh, we do get a lot of calls from neighbors uh, about violations, and I think it goes a long way uh, to have that participation from our community, so I'm thankful for that. Um, in terms of the hours that we work, uh, predominantly um, most of our code officers do work during the day. We have a few code officers who work in evening shift, uh, um, and we also are looking at ways to begin to establish, as you said, the, re the realities are, I mean, we can still do overtime and we can still do ways to get out in the community if we need to, uh, even currently, but we are talking uh, a lot internally once we start becoming more robustly involved in, like you said, the noise ordinance violations. You know, how can we make sure that we're staffed in the evenings and weekends when a lot of those calls might be uh, more relevant? Um, but we're looking forward to that challenge and I'm sure we'll, be, we'll find a, a solution. Thank you very much. And uh, switching gears just a little bit, talk a little bit about the zone in initiative. Um, when we might see our, you know, the proposed changes coming to council and when we might actually take a vote on it. So right now, um, the plan, uh, as you know, uh, we're focused on 11,000 parcels along our uh, trans transportation hubs, corridors, uh, thoroughfares. Uh, the second phase will be coming after this where we maybe get farther into neighborhoods. Um, but for those 11,000 parcels, we expect to have a draft code uh, this spring. So sometime uh, before April, uh, we would hope to have a code that we would be able to share uh, as a draft, begin to get some community input. And the hope right now would be to uh, pass that code prior to council break. Thank you very much, Director Chair. Back to you. Thank you. Um, council Member Remy uh, just um, made me think of uh, if someone receives a citation from code enforcement, uh, what is the suggestion from the department? Uh, and, and I'm asking this because uh, we do know that there are lots of calls that come in from 311. Uh, Sometimes it takes residents um, uh, um, off guard when they receive a citation and not responding is not the way to, to handle it. So um, I'll, I'll put that uh, put that at your your feet there, Director. Yeah. So you know our hope and the way we train our code officers is to be very collaborative with property owners. I mean, what we're really looking for is uh, a solution to the problem that exists. It doesn't really help us either to spend resources. Uh, following up on orders and complaints, going through an elaborate court system, or trying to go through an entire process that takes resources and time. What we would rather have is for folks who get those some citations, the code officer and, and contact information is on that citation, and we would like for them to follow up. I know there can be some, you know, as you said, hesitancy or fear or lack of understanding of what uh, uh, the citations are, but we, I really like to think of those more as invitations for people to talk to us about how they can get into compliance. Mm -hmm. And we regularly work with people over time mm -hmm. to try to bring things into compliance. We recognize that, uh, as was mentioned earlier, some, some of our citizens are resource challenged and other uh, problems might address. And we, we understand how to focus on more of our serious safety hazards first as a priority. Some of the other things we would really like for folks to partner with us uh, because we can be very helpful. Uh, as said earlier, we might even be able to direct them to resources to help them to comply. Thank you for that. I just think it's incredibly important as we continue to navigate the supply and demand issue um, that folks know that uh, there are resources available 
uh, and we don't want to see someone end up in court that does not need to be um, in court. All right, next we will hear from the Department of Development, um, Director Mike Stevens, who will present on the proposed budget in the housing and homelessness space. Director. Good evening, Chair Favor, members of council. Um, I'm pleased to be joined by my colleague, Deputy Director Hannah Jones, as well this evening. The department's operating budget focused on housing and homelessness is proposed at $12.4 million, which is an increase of 19% over last year. This increase includes adding 10 new positions to support the implementation of the city's housing strategy within our housing division and the addition of a social worker supporting our homelessness assistance efforts. Our housing and our homelessness teams at a cost of 12.4 million are deploying just under $90 million annually in funding for services to help reduce the housing instability that is being experienced by our residents due to the scarcity of housing in our city. In 2022, Columbus voters approved a $200 million bond initiative giving us the ability to invest upwards of $50 million annually to increase the number of affordable housing units and reduce housing scarcity. The scarcity of housing in our city and our region and our region not only causes housing prices and rents to escalate, pricing families out of housing, but also expands the opportunities for exploitation of our most vulnerable individuals and families. We certainly saw those outcomes in 2023 and as we begin 2024, our priorities will shift to thoughtfully, effectively, and successfully addressing the impacts of our constrained housing market. Our housing division is supporting $30 million in projects anticipated to add 1,230 affordable units into our community. Funding larger density projects is a complex process. We look to make investments in projects that are positioned to make positive impacts to the neighborhoods they are located within. Housing Division Administrator Rita Paris and her team continue to engage our community partners to maximize the impacts of our investment. Looking back since 2018, we have annually proposed approximately funding $5.4 million for homeless assistance efforts from the general fund. However, those are not the only resources we deploy. We use multiple funding sources to, accom to accomplish our objectives. Our annual our average annual spend on homelessness assistance using multiple funding sources has been approximately $10 million per year, with some years reaching up to $18 million. In 2023, for the second year in a row, we invested an additional 9.7 to the 5.4 million for a combined 15.1 towards homelessness assistance. Lastly, the city has invested 53 million of 68 million in emergency rental assistance and housing stability services. We are investing the remaining 15 million now. There is no greater imperative in our community than to assure that all families not only have the access to affordable housing and good paying jobs, but that the housing is safe and stable, meets a family's needs, and allows them to access all the opportunities in our community. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. If we can leave the um, the slide up uh, just to help folks as we just move through um, the presentation. Thank you, Director Messer. S Director, I'm so sorry, Director Stevens. Um, and you may have already hit on this just a little bit, but what do you see as the housing division's top priorities in 2024? So our housing division is going to spend um, 2024, not only ramping up and adding the new staff that we are requesting as part of this budget, um, and that is to implement the programs that we have in place to address our housing scarcity issue. One part of our housing division operation is around housing finance. So putting that team in place that continues to work with those developers who are making those investments in projects that are um, helping, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the, per, I'm sorry, those permanent supportive housing projects that are serving those individuals and families making anywhere from $25,000 to $70,000 a year. We're also, our housing division team is going to focus on continuing to process those applications around the housing abatement uh, that encourages more investment and delivery of new units to uh, the city of Columbus. 
our housing strategy is about not only increasing the number of units that are built, but also make sure that we're maintaining that naturally occurring affordability that already exists in our community. So our staff is also going to spend time on emergency housing repair programs, uh, as well as our lead program that we get federal and state dollars for. Um, and then finally, the housing team is going to help and participate across the department as we deal with some of our homelessness issues and making sure that um, we are investing our dollars in a way that is including all of those individuals in our community who might not have the access to housing that they need and partnering with those advocates in our community who are out there every day on the front lines addressing our needs around homelessness. Have you established any metrics or targets in order to, to gauge your success in this endeavor? Yeah, we uh, constantly are working on internally on um, the big metric is, and this isn't a 2024 outcome, but the big metric is doubling the number of housing units that are built in our region in the next 15 years. Right now, um, we're approximately right around 12,000 units, and I think it's actually went down in 23. Uh, the goal is to get up to 25,000 units being delivered. One of the efforts that uh, our Deputy Director for Housing Strategy, Aaron Prosser, will continue to work on is how do we engage the region in a, in a regional coalition to move forward on um, increasing the number of units built? How do we, as a city, lead the way and partner with the Building and Zoning Department as they move forward and bring forward the update of the zoning code to allow more um, density and more development in the right areas so people have access not only to housing but opportunities. So that work uh, that Aaron's going to be leading and the city shall lead and hopefully bring along our, our community partners uh, around the region to see more units built. Uh, that's, that's at the end of the day that's the biggest driver. Um, clearly last year in the capital improvement budget we had 50 million dollars of the housing affordable housing bond dollars uh, authorized, we need to deploy the $50 million into projects that are going to get us more units. So that is a, it is a very big goal, uh, Director, given um, where we are at, where we ended last year with the number of units that were um, able to come online um, and uh, kind of putting that up against the pressures um, whether that be the market itself, interest rates, rising construction costs, um, lack of um, um, uh, folks to actually build these homes. So how are we going to, how are we going to do this? How are we going to reach this goal? And you talked a little bit about some of those um, efforts uh, that have been put in place, but uh, I think well, what we know is that we continue to receive feedback um, that it's, it's difficult to get things online, we can't find a place to live, and so how do we assure residents that um, this is top priority? Uh, thank you for that question, Chair Favor. Um, I think we will continue to uh, have a communications drumbeat, not only to our community within the city, but those regional communities and partners around that need to join us in this journey. Um, the mayor talks a lot about the housing crisis in Central Ohio is not a Columbus crisis, it's a regional crisis. However, we want, we're willing to lead on that. So we will continue to, one, use our affordable housing dollars and invest in projects and partner with the state and their tax credits, as well as the county and their magnet funds to leverage as many projects as we can to get as many units built. We will and, and continue to engage with our regional partners um, with examples of what we are doing around our zoning code update to encourage density and increase in density and, and new units. Um, we will continue to partner with building and zoning services on as they improve their processes and, ex and, and Director Messer did a nice job explaining, you know, what are they doing to expedite the process to get from entitlement to permit. Um, we'll continue to work with our Office of Diversity and Inclusion and the partners that they are working with and, and companies and small businesses that are building the capacity that's needed to build these units. Um, I'm cautiously optimistic that our inflation numbers are holding steady. 
Um, I'm hoping that at the very least interest rates will hold steady. Um, that will be an important part of seeing more units coming online. Um, I also am, am proud of the investment the city's made in our emerging developer program that is housed at the Affordable Housing Trust and finding new developers and new um, entrepreneurs around housing that are coming to the forefront. And when you talk to this cohort, uh, the cohorts that have gone through this program, they're really interested and they're passionate about not just building houses, but building houses to serve their community. So we'll continue to support that effort and partner with the Affordable Housing Trust. Um, that is a, a short list of how we're going to have to collaborate and um, use partnership to advance this work. And specifically around the homelessness work, uh, we'll need to continue to engage with the Community Shelter Board and other advocates and partners in the community who are, who are out on the front line addressing the needs of those individuals who are uh, experiencing homelessness, uh, working now very closely in part of the group that is doing a, uh, an assessment that the shelter board is leading on our system as a whole as a, um, and what role we all play in that, is, uh, in that system. So I think that's helping us develop a plan that's going to address our needs in the next five years and not the success that we might have had in the previous 15. Thank you for that. And if, if I could go just one step further, uh, Mayor Ginther and I had the opportunity to um, participate in a discussion uh, that was held um, just last week by the Columbus Women's Commission focusing on um, rise in, in homelessness, evictions, um, lack of affordable housing, specifically as it relates to the experience of black women. Um, on any chart that you could pull up, whether we're talking about affordability, uh, homelessness, or evictions, uh, black women, and specifically black women with children, um, are topping those charts. And so um, as we continue to um, really dive a bit deeper into this conversation around the equity agenda and how we ensure that the work that we are doing is, is meeting the demand of the moment, um, can you talk about some of the strategies that are in place? Because the reality is that housing insecurity is not felt equally across our community disproportionately and impacts people of color, uh, low income wage earners, um, those who are disabled. So how are we ensuring that our policies uh, are um, um, reaching those communities? So Chair Favor, uh, what we're doing is we, as we are funding our partners, we are making it clear that our priorities are around mothers and families and those communities that have been um, historically and disproportionately uh, affected by this and making sure, make sure they understand that um, th there is a priority on making the, the investments that they're doing and how we're deploying the money, whether it's non-congregate sheltering uh, or other areas of how to get folks housed, those individuals, those, those mothers and families are going to the front of the line to find the, the resources and, and the housing that they need. Um, and, and we'll continue to push that as a, as a priority for our efforts and, and the funding that uh, we're providing with that. Thank you. Let me turn it over to my colleagues to see if anyone has any questions, because I, you know, I could keep going. <laughs> Councilmember Green. Okay. Thank you so much again for being here. And I just want to be very clear, this is not just a Columbus problem. And it's not even just a regional problem. This is an everywhere problem. Um, and I, um, you know, with my three weeks of experience, I, I genuinely do believe that um, you guys are so committed to looking at this issue holistically across a continuum. And so I just really want to thank you um, for your approach to that work. And um, I hope you know, maybe having a social worker in this space can help us bring a different perspective. I think that's the benefit of having multidisciplinary teams that um, we're able to look at things from different angles. And so I'm definitely looking forward to continuing this conversation beyond just today. But I do just have a couple of questions. First, um, just like some numbers questions. I, I'm confused because some of the, the numbers and like the budget don't necessarily match kind of what I'm seeing on the screen. And this might just be because I'm new or the chart I haven't seen before, but 
Um, can, you, can you clarify for me so that the 5.4 million for CSB permanent supportive housing, as it's listed right there, where is that in here? Is that in the general fund, like administrative section in the other line? Yeah, my understanding is the uh, our CSP contract is part of the administration, okay. part of the development budget of the, the 5.4 is there, correct? Okay, because there wasn't like a line item for the CSB, so I, you know, I wasn't sure what else would be maybe included. I, I was assuming it might be the other. And then I also just want to clarify too, so the affordable housing trust, I know that's not money that's like going to CSB. The staff costs, those would be like internal staff costs, right, to manage the the bond funds, they're not external funds that are going out. That, that's correct, the staff is internal staff that is managing the contracts and the funding within and, the division. And then like that blue chunk, that homelessness chunk, um, what, what, what is included in that? That's so, not funding that's going so to So that, 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 um, that, sh that blue chunk represents the amount of the administration portion of the general fund budget for development. Within that blue chunk is the $6.1 million that we're spending on general fund dollars around homelessness. Okay, okay, so that would be like our internal teams. I know there's been expansion over there, which is wonderful, like some navigators and... Some of the external team and some contracts as well. So of the 5.4 million for community shelter board is included in that 6.1 number. Okay, um, so I guess, I guess my question is, and again, you know, kind of like thinking through this challenge from a little bit of a different lens, and thank you so much. It's, I know it's a lot of money and I'm, I'm very new to this space, but... Um, so I, I guess sort of my, the way that I'm thinking about this request is not necessarily, um, you know, an increase. I think what we're looking at here is that there are many, you know, sectors across our community, including our community of people who are unhoused, who are in crisis, but also our community services sector is in crisis um, and doesn't have the resources that they need to do the job that we need them to do. And so I've been kind of thinking about this through the lens of, um, of how we would do any other city contract. Um, so the city has an essential service for a road to be paved and we contract out that work. And um, the, um, the contractor, you know, we put a scope of work together, the contractor bids on it. Um, we accept the lowest bid with the expectation that the contractor is kind of coming to the table in good faith and um, you know, is gonna be able to complete the scope of work and will be made whole for that, right? Um, and so I'm just concerned at, um, you know, kind of in the behavioral health care space, we talked to it about, uh, we talk about it um, in the term of parity. Um, I think here, you know, this is the equity committee, it would make more sense to use that term. Um, but I'm just a little bit concerned because it seems to me like we have an organization who's coming to us um, you know, with a good faith ask and saying, this is what it costs to do this job, to meet the scope of services. Um, and I'm scared, you know, we, we wouldn't like haggle down another contractor. That just wouldn't be something we would do. And it seems like we're holding two different standards for the way that we're approaching um, our nonprofit partners and our for-profit partners. And the result of that is either we don't get the services that, you know, we expect or that the community needs um, or, you know, other risks to the organization themselves, like they're not being made whole for the work they're trying to do or, you know, it's well documented across our state and across our country, the um, desperate workforce shortages that we're experiencing across our community services sector um, and the needs are far outweighing um, the resources that are going into them and our ability um, to to hire and retain staff um, is so critical in the context of this because this is all, you know, we're talking about humans and, and relationships matter, right? When it comes to, to getting people to the next steps and these systems are so complex, they're so complex. I've been working in this field for 10 years um, and now I'm a city council member. If a person came to me today and said I need to be housed, my answer would be to call the community shelter board. What happens if there's nobody on the other end of that phone 
um, because we're not paying them a, a living wage that's comparable with the dignity of the work that they're doing and their contribution to our community, what happens if the person on the other end of that phone is brand new or is constantly revolving because we can't pay competitive wages um, to address the workforce shortages? Um, I think this is an essential city service um, that we're contracting out to um, a partner who's very valuable to the health and well-being of this community. And I guess um, after this TED talk, <laughs> um, you know, I would be curious to get your thoughts about how we can, how we can improve equity, how we can improve parity. You know, a big part of this funding request is about um, wages for employees and having a minimum wage that is a living wage. Um, you know, in any other type of city contract, we hold ourselves to that standard if we're contracting out any other work. Um, you know, in my mind, we have to be accountable to those standards in a way that is equitable with our nonprofit partners than our, um, than our, um, than just our LLCs and our for-profit businesses that are making money off this work, right? You know, these are organizations that are, um, that are, have social missions that are giving in major ways to our community. So curious to get your thoughts about specifically the funding, the piece of the funding request that's not reflected in this uh, proposed budget um, that would address the workforce issues and the minimum wage across the workforce um, and how we can work um, better to make sure we're um, looking at these requests through an equity lens. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Green. Uh, the request put forward by the Community Shelter Board uh, this year, really, they did a nice job in addressing the overall needs on how we need to be investing in this system. Um, in previous conversations, I have likened it to, we've been operating a water plant for 20 years and not making the required annual maintenance. and. At a certain point, that because of the deferred maintenance, a pretty significant bill comes due. Um, as a community, we're at that point. As a community, we have not invested enough in our work around homelessness. And, it, and, I, and I was very intentional in the word community. Um, I've been proud over the last couple of years, the significant increase that the city, the mayor and city council have chosen to put forth to Contribute, contribute and invest in our homelessness system. Um, I work closely with Shannon Isom at the Community Shelter Board and, and her leadership, and she understands the need to bring the whole community along on getting those funding levels. Um, we heard a couple years ago from those providers of um, services, you know, some of the shelter providers and others that we, they were, not only do we have a crisis around housing and homelessness, but as providers, they were in crisis, and the individuals they had working there were in crisis. So um, the last couple of years, we have made a significant increase in the contribution to that work, so it could go to help, we called it surge funding, and approximately about $9.7 million um, each of the last couple of years. You know, sometimes I get lost in which fund we actually pulled it out of, so I don't know if some of that was the, what was considered art money, uh, American Rescue Plan money, what was CARES money, what was it, just some general fund dollars that we had available. Um, but it's a, it, it's a significant amount and one that I know in talking to Shannon on a regular basis, she's working to fill that gap. And while this budget doesn't reflect that amount at request, we know we're, we continue to have those conversations with her and she's talking to other others in the community to find a way to close the gap in her request. And I, I was pleased to see that she's going to be here today and I know can speak to some of the work she's doing as well. So I'll stop talking. Thank you so much for that. And, and yeah, I, I know how committed you are to this. I just want to say I hope, hope that was okay for me to share all of that. Um, the, the last thing that I also want to address too, um, just in relation to the flat funding of this organization, and this is, I'm sure is not going to come as a shock, but you know, not, a, not even just considering the, the workforce issues and the need to retain and attract talent, 
talent to do this very, very important and very challenging and complex work. Um, but also just in general, and our own city budget is reflective of this, the cost of doing business across the board has increased. The cost of employer-based or employer-sponsored healthcare plans has increased exponentially in the last five years. The cost, since the last time they received an increase, the cost of um, a utilities, the cost of building maintenance issues, it, it, everything has gone up. Um, and so um, I, I just would also like to make sure that that is at least expressed in terms of how we're looking at funding this organization. Um, because even if we're, even if we continue flat funding an organization like this, we're really reducing funding um, in conjunction with those inflation costs if we're not thoughtful about um, what we're funding and how we're funding um, and the support that we're then wrapping around our partners to maybe offset any of those costs. Um, so it is, um, I guess, do you, do you have a thought on that or, is, or maybe we can continue the conversation? Yeah, I, I look forward to continuing the conversation. It clearly costs all around are, are going up and, uh, but we're also looking at some different innovative approaches on how to address um, individuals who've been on the land for a long time and how do we get them in, in a space that is more conducive for that transition and that costs more money too. Um, you know, we this last month, city council passed funding for uh, warming centers uh, this year and that's the second year we've been doing that and um, that's a, a, another approach to how are we making sure that we're, we're reaching everybody we can who are living on the land. So um, I look forward to continuing the conversation. I, I know um, this document shows that that line item amount that is in the development budget continues to be flat funded, but I think we've always found ways to partner together to continue to make increased investment and then work with our partners in the community and other investors to make sure they are keeping up with us and, 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 and walking with us in this, in this journey to fund what needs to be funded. And I'll just say one more thing. One more thing, I think that's how we have the best outcomes too, that holistic, whole person, uh, centered care across a continuum. So those collaborations are great and there, I think there's lots of opportunity for that. Um, that's my last question, Chair Faber. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Council Member Green, uh, any other Council Members? Questions, Council Member Remy? Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> Excuse me, Director. Um, with the expansion of the, the CRA citywide, you know, what are some of the anticipated um, you know, results that we might see more immediately with, with our residents uh, as it relates to affordable housing? Uh, thank you, uh, Council Member Remy. That's one of the many tools we are putting in place to encourage investment and housing construction. And I hear immediate, and I'd like to be able to say in three weeks we're gonna be cutting a ribbon and, and individuals will be able to move into a home. Um, what we're, the goal there is to help reduce that gap between the cost to build new housing units and the revenue that's generated from those new housing units. One way to close that gap is just to wait for the market to catch up to the cost and we'll continue to see increased housing. And you know, I'm getting out of my depth here. Usually I have our, our Deputy Director Aaron Prosser who's really good talking about this, but uh, I've heard it enough. And, but other ways to close that gap is through this abatement tool. Um, we're encouraged that we'll see more projects move forward because we've reduced some of the, the expense gap so we can then projects can be delivered that are within more with what our market can generate here in Columbus. But what we did and, and, and through council's policy on the housing abatement is we set aside income qualified for, um, units for affordability. So those individuals, depending on the size of your household, and, but those individuals making 60 to $90,000 a year uh, aren't gonna pay more than 30% of their income on housing. And that's that's a critical piece. And since we've implemented that policy and we've had a set aside of 20%, we have seen those projects that have taken advantage of it, over 30% of those projects have been set, units have been set aside. I'm sorry, 30% of the projects, of the units in those projects have been set aside for affordability. So we've exceeded what the public policy goal on the set aside is. Thank you, Chair Brimming. Council President Harden. 
Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you again, Director. Um, this question will it could be for you. It can be for um, for Ms. Eisen when she uh, uh, presents. But um, we're we're in the middle of a a cold spell, a inclement weather, uh, extreme weather. Could you unpack what is our role uh, when we have a severe weather incident? Um, what is the city's role versus what is uh, uh, CSB's role and how do we hold ourselves accountable for what that does like take me behind the the curtain of what does it look like to stand up an operation um, and who's in charge like who, who does that I'm trying to understand what this looks like from a city a, really a community perspective I'm not putting this just on the city what does this look like from a community perspective when we have severe weather right now it's cold in six months it will be hot heat yeah. what does it look like to keep the community safe when we have severe weather? So ideally, Council President, thank you for that question. And, and, and thank you for um, starting off the hearing with, with, with the sharing um, of your experience yesterday. I thought that was, um, it was impactful and powerful. So I appreciate you taking the time and sharing that. What we do, you know, we, through our collaboration and through our system, and I'm going to defer on some of that question to um, Ms. Isom and, and let her kind of get into the, the operational detail because it's her team that does that. But before we know it's even going to be cold, and we saw some of that work in this fall when we were coming together talking about the warming centers this year, is we, we bring our partners together and collaborate on what, what, what are we trying to achieve. And, that one, and clearly in a situation like this is to get people inside and keep them in, in some type of shelter where they're not going to freeze to death. Um, but we also try to understand in our role, what can we do to help fund that? What can we do through other resources that the city has? Um, unfortunately, this weekend, we did not excel um, and we didn't communicate as well with regards to the community rec centers. But I was encouraged to see the announcement go out when the temperatures hit. Um, that we are opening some of our rec centers as warming spaces, like we do in the summertime when it gets hot. Um, one of the things we did, and it's one of those small policy victories uh, that you really just don't see on an everyday basis, but you know, our human service team worked really hard in, w with Chair Favor and the courts to have them put in, the administrative judge put in a order that once temperatures hit below a certain level, they stop doing set outs on evictions. So it, it's those type of um, efforts through the system that where we're working together to make sure that we're not, I would say, caught flat-footed or running around the day of an extreme weather event trying to understand what are we going to do. Um, I'm really impressed with the amount of forethought and effort that the Community Shelter Board team puts in place to make sure we have the right um, spaces available and we're engaging with the individuals to make sure they know where those spaces are. And like I said, I'll let Ms. Isom kind of get more into the details on how they operationalize that on a cold weather day. And, and again, this is probably, this will be probably between you and, and Ms. Isom as well. Do we feel like for the next, say, 60 hours where we're going to be in this inclement weather that we are, we have the resources that, that the administration or that CSB ne needs to keep all of our residents uh, safe as we go through the rest of this code spell, because we're not done yet. I think that it gets better, or they say Sunday maybe, uh, but do, do, you, do we feel confident as a city, as a community, and again, this is uh, a question for Ms. Isom, what do we need to do to make sure that even for the rest of this code spell that we have everything covered? From my perspective, I am confident in that. Okay. Um, the work and the community shelter board team started even earlier in 23 in talking with us and other stakeholders on how do we best set up warming centers and kind of that more community-based sheltering. Um, and that's, that's in place. Uh, you know, it, 
the funding's there now, which is great, and it might not actually be there there, but yeah. the our, our friends at the Community Shelter Board are, are, are moving forward knowing that the dollars will be there and, and take care of that. The other thing is we are in an over, you know, the, the, it's an overflow situation. No one gets turned away from our shelters and to a point where if there's not physical space in the shelters, they are looking at hotels and Hannah's fidgeting a little bit, so I, I, I might be getting a little out of my lane, so I want to make sure. If, um, so we are, you know, no one gets turned away. N no, it, it, there, there will be a space for you if you need it. In our, in, in our system. Thank you. Thank you. If I could just build off of that, because I think what Council President Harden shared was that uh, someone was turned away or they were told that they had to leave. So can we clarify that that is still the policy that residents can rely on? And can we clarify that rec centers are open during this extreme weather that we're experiencing right now? So I, I'm going to defer to Ms. Isom on the operational okay. uh, and let her answer that question on the daily operational practices. Um, our Recreation and Parks Department has a policy, a, an inclement weather policy, that if the temperatures hit a certain uh, level that they open up as warming centers or cooling centers. Um, we have gone, you know, we, we were aware of the situation prior to the, the hearing tonight. We will continue to engage with our colleagues there to better understand what's going to be open and how we're going to communicate that. While we're here um, on our um, unhoused um, residents, uh, over the, well, I would say towards the end of the pandemic, um, because throughout the pandemic, I believe the policy was not to engage in remediations. And so we have, um, there has been a, um, uh, an effort to move forward um, whether or not the city is the owner of a property, um, if there are individuals who are not allowed to be on that property. Can you clarify the city's remediation policy as it relates to um, uh, individuals who might be on land that the city owns uh, or uh, if residents are on land that the city does not own and the use of um, an enforcement entity like the Columbus Police Department. So what I'll clarify is if the individuals are on a property that is not city owned, the city does not perform the remediation nor fund the remediation um, at that and but that doesn't mean we are not there if our partners in the community who are working to serve those individuals who are who are part of that encampment um, and trying to get them the services they need so we can get them into some type of shelter um, ultimately when the property owner decides that they are going to remediate situation um, usually it's a they've issued some type of trespassing order and they work with public safety and division of police um, on on that um, the city's policy on land that we own is we engage with those individuals who are on that land we understand trying to understand their needs we bring those um, community outreach partners to give them services. Um, but ultimately the goal is housing and to get them off the land and into some housing. Um, and we will remediate a camp after engaging with the individuals there uh, over an extended period of time and hopefully getting them the services they need to get into the stable housing um, that's eluding them at the time. And so when you say over um, a, a certain amount of time, we're not saying a camp has been identified, the city comes out, and a week later it's being remediated, that there is an investment that is being made from um, individuals, whether they are employed by the city of Columbus or other entities that we contract with, to engage with those residents and 
provide a solution that might work for that person. An active camp will not be remediated within a week. We will work and we will bring in our partners within the system um, and those community outreach specialists to help us um, help those individuals get the services they need. If there is an encampment on city property that is vacant, we will go in and clean up that encampment in a shorter period of time. Okay. But um, we will, we have protocols in place to verify that it is a vacant camp. Thank you. And if I can switch back over to, to housing um, as a part of this committee um, hearing. Uh, late last year, the county auditor's office conducted their reappraisal process and the average property tax increase countywide is 12%. An increase like this can be devastating to vulnerable communities like our senior population, those on a fixed income, and minority homeowners. Is there anything in the budget to support Columbus residents facing this increase? Uh, no, there is not specific funding to address that. What I will say is part of our work this year around our housing strategy is how do we benchmark other communities and what are they doing to address um, certain property tax exemptions for their most vulnerable residents. A lot of times it's, it's seniors and individuals on fixed incomes. Um, and what can we do from an advocacy level at the state level mm -hmm. to get those changes that are needed to um, provide exemptions to keep people housed. Um, so it, it's, it's top of mind. It's just there's not a fund set up to close the gap on that increase. But from your perspective, the advocacy is being done to advocate to those um, entities that could assist the city? Uh, right now, the research is being done to put together some policy recommendations and, and things that we could then advocate for okay. uh, at the state level. And I, I look forward to your you, the partnership with you, Chair Favor, and members of City Council on that advocacy. I think it, it's going to take many voices. With emergency rental assistance from the federal government likely coming to an end, how is the department prepared to continue to meet the housing needs of residents? Good evening, Chair Favor. Uh, excuse me, as we look forward with the emergency rental assistance program, one of the things that we have attempted to do is to continue to refine it and fine tune it to ensure that we are getting to our most vulnerable populations. So we recognize that ultimately we want to um, look forward to 2025 with a sustainable program that supports those and really helps us to provide housing stability. So as we move away from triaging necessarily eviction court but continuing to get further upstream to families who may be couch surfing surfing, excuse me, focusing on um, our female-headed households of color, uh, figuring out additional ways to partner with Celebrate One and others. Um, so for us, it's really going to be how do we build up the infrastructure that we started with the Central Ohio Stable Housing Network to create a sustainable way to intervene moving forward past 2025. Does use of the um, American Rescue Plan dollars factor into funding any of um, the department's efforts as it relates to the plan that you just laid out or this budget currently? Specific to rental assistance, no, it does not. Our goal would be to explore uh, revenue sources within the department budget or ways to collaborate and partner with our nonprofit partners and philanthropic organizations to meet a community need. Thank you. Um, in the city of Columbus, there is a need for more permanent supportive housing units. I know that tonight we're joined by our friends from Bread that continuously advocate uh, for those uh, residents at the zero to 30% of the area median income. What is the division's plan in 2024 to add um, these needed units into the housing market? 
today we were actually just talking about home ARP. So um, one of the unique things that did come out of COVID as well as the American Rescue Plan Act was identifying a specific funding source that really focused on building up housing for very low income residents. So we call that home ARP. Um, and it's 16 million that has been allocated specifically for permanent supportive housing. So we have three projects that have been earmarked for that. We also just released an RFP for consultant services um, because of one of the goals of Home ARP is to really look at supportive services. So back to what you were saying, Co-Chair Green, um, on the long-term human services support, it's a way to provide operational support for our partners as well. So one of our last goals for the funding that will not go to support built projects is to look at how do we support our partners, specifically those who are working with the unhoused on the land. So as you think about what we did on East Mound Street, mm -hmm. how do we really underpin that and find out ways to provide for our operational network partners who are on the land but might not be tied to a specific housing project. So that's one of our key goals um, outside of leveraging funds for the larger low income housing tax credit projects. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'd like to um, hear from our invited guests. Uh, we have spoke um, in great detail about um, what we are experiencing right now with this extreme cold weather, and um, Ms. Isom's name has been brought up a few times tonight. So um, at this time, I'd like to invite Ms. Isom uh, to the podium. Um, she serves as the president and CEO of the Community Shelter Board. Welcome back to Council, Ms. Isom. Good evening. Okay. I want to first just thank you for a moment to um, approach the podium and to speak very definitively about the budget, but also what I am I'm hoping is that we'll be able to also answer some very specific questions uh, so I can stand alongside uh, with the city administration on that. So as I address President Hardin and both the gentle women as well as the gentlemen of the council, um, I have, uh, through CSB and through certainly our stakeholders, have moved through several iterations of this budget. I would like to spend just a moment to go over some of those main points, and certainly if you have more questions, we'll dive in. Um, this first slide is why this investment matters. Um, Community Shelter Board has been talked about today, and, um, and, and appropriately so. Uh, these dollars are in alignment what we've already been speaking to and through. Our safety net is being stretched, and I am concerned that our safety net is being stretched beyond what we can uh, tape up and glue. And so uh, these asks have really, really been thought about in a strategic way. They have undergirded goals and objectives, both qualitatively and quantitatively. And yes, it's a large ask. But the large ask is centered on this. The Community Shelter Board is charged with the responsibility that we create an optimized system. That means um, it is imperative that we use words that we know on what we're going to do as the goal. We'd like to cure. Curing does not mean that we will not have homelessness. Curing means that we have a readied system that people will not fall out. What does that look like? Um, that means that our response will always be aligned. We spoke about many things today I would like to underscore I believe that the number three threat is environmental and climate change. We are seeing extreme and abject, abject causes that are coming through climate, both in the heat and in the winter. And our system isn't readied for that. Uh, it must be. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them. We can read through them. But I want to note a couple of other things. We must quickly engage. We must have systems that are equitable with parity. We must have them suitable. Uh, I believe that President Hardin told a story of, of someone who's been in our shelter for a very long time. They must be short lengths of stays. Our programs must be adept, and we must have a portfolio and a diversity of housing. Uh, 
The landscape, we know this, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, it is increasing, we are in the throes of another point in time count, and I believe that it will be equally as similar. Here are our options. I broke this down into seven strategies with I am hoping that not only that we will continue to move through them for the next couple of years, but more importantly, we get to talk about what we are really talking about. So I am going to rarely talk about big buckets of money and instead talk about where money goes in correlation to strategy, objectives, and goals. They are laid out here. Um, the first one is traditional funding, which I believe that we have been speaking uh, about with um, Director Stevens. And that was the money that the city has, uh, and the city council has continued to give us. But two, three, seven, two through seven, although are singularly and separate, discreetly can be moved, they work the best when iterated on top of each other. Um, I don't have them necessarily in cascading order, however uh, close to it. Um, the winter warming centers are paramount. Not because we can use them only during the winter, but as I said, with climate change, we need resources and communities resources that becomes the town square, the place where everyone knows that this is where we go to navigate. At number three, uh, the base funding, we're having a challenge with staff. Uh, part of the reasons why we see some of the gaps that we see is that we can't retain the staff for long enough to train them around outcomes, quality, and efficiency. It is imperative that one of the number one things that Community Shelter Board does outside of, of curing for homelessness is ensuring that we're standing next to our partners. Um, number four is my favorite. Um, uh, Councilwoman uh, Favor spoke about um, having a disparate number of uh, mothers and, and um, head of household black women uh, with children in our shelters, it's true. It doesn't matter how you slice our data, black women are there. Um, number four, along with the partners such as Celebrate One, we will tackle this to net zero, functional zero homelessness for our families and for uh, pregnant um, people. Uh, finally, uh, addressing uh, street homelessness must be robust. Um, I've just started off with a little bit of a line with that. Uh, flexible funding for emergency crisis, we're in it, whether we're talking about Sawyer Tower or Colonial Village, we're in crisis at all times. I would like us to pull back from that crisis mode and start prospectively knowing that this is our normal, how do we plan for that? And finally, uh, additional system funding. I've spoken about all seven of those, but I want to highlight both three and four very, very specifically. It is imperative that we center our dollars on our people where we have the most impact. I believe that is with uh, paying a right wage so that we can feel good about not that people um, have a job, but that people have a career in social services and in human services. And finally, it is imperative that we put a goal um, uh, not only here within Franklin County, but across this country. And we need to say that we are going to be committed as a number one or maybe a number two um, um, county that will have zero homelessness for families. I'm going to pause there, understanding there's many questions, uh, and take those. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Isom, for that presentation. Let me turn to my colleagues for I, I kick into gear. Um, and um, honestly, I'd, I'd, I'd defer back to Council President Harton and the questions that uh, you had started the committee hearing off with. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and again, thank you, uh, Ms. Sison, for uh, the work that you do. I started off by saying that um, as an elected official, I often view this um, issue from the 30,000 foot view, that we talk about numbers, we talk about budgets, uh, we see proposals. Um, and so for me, yeah, seeing and engaging the way that I did yesterday with the young lady and her child in the code had an impact on me yes. and as elected officials we need proximity and then I also acknowledge uh, and we spoke earlier today that you and your teams have very close proximity with this with this this population this issue and see this every day and yet the proximity we can't let it also get us desensitized I think that's what you said to the to the issue and so I think that this tension that we feel in having this conversation is good it's good, it's, it, it allows for a more um, 
uh, open conversation. That, I, that my goal is to get to somewhere. So specifically what I am talking about, my questions that I was asking Director Stevens were about emergency preparedness when we have uh, situations like we're under, we're, that we're going through right now. My focus right now is to make sure that we feel comfortable about what the next three days, four days looks like in this community as we continue through this code spell. Can you also, like I asked Director Stevens do, pull back the the curtain, explain to us what it looks like when we oper operationalize our emergency winter weather uh, processes when we talk about the our unhoused community. Uh, President Hardin, thank you for the question, and I also appreciate uh, that Director Stevens uh, had this question first, so in all fairness has given me a little bit of time to prepare for the answer. Um, but I would have been prepared because one of the things that I believe was asked is that what is the difference as well between community shelter board during, these, uh, during this crisis as well as with the city. I would like to answer a little bit differently. I really do feel very strongly that we are in partnership and that we should and will continue to have a mutualism of conversation, of um, feedback, uh, and also of what uh, should be celebrated and what we want to see uh, go forward. I am walking into the space now, certainly a year, but the first time as I'm moving through this um, um, time of winter and crisis, and the first thing I did was to check to see if we had a policy for that. And I know that probably sounds a little too simple for uh, an emergent issue, but it is imperative because we are a unified uh, funding agency that everybody is on the same page around the same thing with the same words and the same expectation. Uh, we do. We do. Um, my next question was how are we socializing it and ensuring that both from an assessment and evaluation that people are on the same page. Uh, we did do that. Uh, but I think that what we're finding, whether it is, again, in the summer or in the winter, is that there's some things we just haven't seen before with such abject severity. Um, we could do better with those things. I believe wholeheartedly, and I, I, believe, I you, you told me about the incident, and I will take full responsibility, community shelter board, uh, that not that are we, do we only have proximity to that, we have a system um, that sort of respond to those things. So I, we have work to do with that, evaluation, assessment, uh, then the third thing is that what are the uh, policies we have, but what is then the practice, the protocol, and the procedure? Uh, well, we have that, but how are we making sure that it is standardized, optimized, that it is ready for any emergency, anything that is urgent, which is different, emergent and urgent, uh, sometimes the same. Um, and I think that's where I think we, we could do better, the gap with that. Um, it is no question that where we are today, uh, that emergent and urgent are the norm. And I think there's been times in the past we've had breaks from that. We're not there anymore. The pace is faster, it's quicker, the expectation is greater. Lives are at stake differently than what they were even a couple of years ago. Um, part of the ask, this big ask, is that we can ready a system that we can be proud of uh, for this. So. Um, what is our every day? Our every day is that we work with 17 partners that have come with a, a level of diversity between emergency and long-term or permanent stay. Uh, we speak to them differently. I think that we should be speaking to them in crisis more. I would even say every day. Uh, you mentioned that we have the next 60 hours. Uh, that's what I asked our system, um, um, our CSP people to do. Let's get them on the call for 15 minutes every morning, maybe 15 minutes in the evening. How is it going? What are the gaps? What do we need to respond to? Um, uh, those are some of the things that I believe that we are accountable uh, for. Um, I will tell you, I do believe that both people on the ground as well as technology must be invested in a little bit more as we move through this very emergent, urgent, uh, normal cadence. Um, and so some of this ask is for that. Uh, and then finally, and I'll stop so you can uh, ask more. I, I really, really appreciate, uh, both from the community as well as from this council, any feedback. It allows us to ready ourselves better. Um, but, but as I told staff today, um, we shouldn't depend on the social and emotional work of community to consistently tell us what's not right. That's our job. Uh, 
Uh, and so I hope um, that you will feel rest assured that we will we'll change some of that energy soon. Thank, thank you so much, Ms. Yeah. Uh, Isom. One of the follow-up questions was going to be around, you know, if we're, if we're working to get there, what would it look like in a couple of years if we if fully funded from the request that you have, what would it look like? I think you articulated somewhere. I heard a vision. I heard a, a specific response to right now, but also I heard a bit of the vision. Yes. Um, so my second part of the question is, those are big numbers that we're asking, that, that, that it is asking. We, I think this council believes that though they are uh, uh, serious and necessary uh, funding. But could you talk about the, the when, I, when, I, when I, I said the, the story about the young lady and her daughter, I said this was not just one person's failure, it's a community failure. So these asks can't just be to one entity, one, private sector, one city. Can you talk about how you're, you're thinking about this ask as it pertains to the entire community? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, this ask um, has been, uh, I said socialized, but more importantly, it has been um, truly given to me uh, through the many, many conversations of our partners and our contract partners. Um, outside of that, um, which probably doesn't get enough attention, we have some external stakeholders and some partners that never get funded, uh, but get of, give of themselves um, not only in energy and talent, but also in feedback. Um, some of it, I will tell you, has been scathing, but rightly so. I think that when you're dealing with the human condition, energy and emotion, anger, we should see. It's normal. Um, and with that, I, have, I don't believe I have anything on this piece of paper, not one dime that is not going towards these strategies and goals that have not been informed by our stakeholders, our partners, um, as well as the people that we serve. Um, I am proud of this ask. Although I will continue to shake my head and say it is a big ask, it is an appropriate ask. It is appropriate. Um, um, and so because of that, I am um, not, not at all ashamed or, nor fearful of this ask. Um, I think also what Director Stevens has said, um, and I've uh, made a promise uh, to this, this whole ask, is that we need all hands stacked for this to happen. Um, yes, do we want the full funding? Yes. But we want the full funding with as much diversity within our portfolio as possible. It holds us accountable, and it holds us in care, and it holds us in concern. Um, so um, understanding that we still have some partners that are looking through it, uh, and they're giving me feedback, but I feel very confident that I have listened to every voice uh, and socialized this. So this is a community, not a CSB. This is a community ask. Do any of my colleagues have any additional questions? Councilmember Remy? Thank you, Chair. And um, I just got to say, you know, when I saw that you were announced and when you came on the scene and we were at a motel together up at. Can you say that a little differently? <laughs> <laughs> Clarif clarify that, Councilmember yeah. Remy. Yeah, clarify I, I stepped into that one. <laughs> Uh, we were at the Red Roof Inn up, yeah. up in yeah. Cleveland yeah. Avenue. That's not any better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> dealing, dealing with latitude. There we go. Yes. I'm, I'm getting to it. Okay. I'm a little slow speaker sometimes, but dealing with the crisis, yeah. you know, where, where we were flying the plane as the crisis unfolded. And thanks to this department and the work that you had, you brought into this space. Um, we were able to navigate it, not perfectly, mm -hmm. but certainly in a way that um, led to the next crisis, which is Colonial Village and, you know, all the things that, again, are emergent and urgent when they do occur. I'm just as excited today 
uh, about your arrival and the thought and the process that you put into this because I know what this ask means so this is the big ask it's a critical ask yeah. that is a community ask and it is something that you know from the minute that you brought it up and my former colleague Liz Brown brought it up mm -hmm. to me you know I am committed to working towards this along with I think most of my colleagues to and all of the colleagues to try to find a solution we have worked very very hard to set the standard in this community with our incentives to offer a living wage at $20 an hour. Our city workers are now to a point where we are offering $20 an hour because we know that we cannot be in this city. It, we can't have people living in the city below that number. It's just, it's financially impossible. And so it is very critical that we work together to try to find those solutions. But that is not the only thing that I wanted to ask about because sometimes it's the simple questions and I know that you're talking with your staff and you're talking with you know your your partners about the next 60 hours but a simple question that came to mind and council president brought it up a little bit earlier was why are the shelters kicking people out on a day, and we know that's the policy. We, we, they ask people to leave, they ask people throughout the day, and I don't, you know, we, we don't need to get into that piece of it, why that's a policy, but certainly when it is a critical moment in time where we were having frigid temperatures and you have a mother and a child and they're being asked to leave and go find something else to do, we failed mm -hmm. because those sh our rec centers were not open. Mm -hmm. And I am incredibly frustrated with the administration at that fact. That should have never have happened. Or it should have been communicated to us on council and everybody else in the community that that wasn't occurring. Don't make the announcement and then, oh, well, we're just going to not have it open today. It's a failure. But what I'm asking is, when we think about policy and we think about the simple things, why are they being asked to leave to begin mm -hmm. with? Because it seems like that's a very logical question yeah, to ask. It's an excellent question. Uh, Councilman Remy, thank you for the question. Um, let, me, let me first answer for the moment. Uh, in the moment, uh, and we do, I mean, we're in, in Ohio. I would have been stunned if we don't have some type of winter policy, a winter uh, weather policy, um, and we do. Uh, and in fact, this exact um, example that we're speaking of and, and the shelter that we were speaking of, um, they know the policy, they do the policy, they implement the policy. Uh, and, and, and we were all under the shelter system, under the policy that, a couple of things. Those that are banded from, um, are prohibited from coming back into shelter, those must go away when we're in inclement um, crisis weather. Um, uh, the, the, the breaks that shelters take to clean, uh, we don't do that um, when we're in the winter uh, uh, process. I'm still investigating, um, but I would tell you for the right now, uh, we believe that there is potentially a staff that wasn't up to speed or someone that uh, potentially slipped through those cracks. No excuse, but we believe that's it. Um, we're still investigating to see um, if, that, if that was the practice. Uh, were there more out there and, and, and uh, we just didn't know it. So, so um, it is not the practice, it is not the practice, it is not the practice during winter inclement weather. We, we have it in policy, it is codified, people know the pra practice of it, and I would feel very confident to say that our shelters and the leaders of those shelters know the practice of it as well, but, but we'll continue to look. In general, your question though is, um, why the break? Um, interestingly enough, uh, Councilman Remy, I am, um, I am continuing to scratch my head of that too. Coming from a system uh, that also was shelter, it is an, an artifact um, of, of old, um, that, it, that we believe that it is imperative for people to be out of the shelter to pull themselves up in the, by their bootstraps. That's really what it comes from. You need to go out, you need to find a job, you need to find resources, and if you don't feel like going out, we're t the building is taking a break and we're moving you out. Maybe that, that, that was, uh, um, from a history past, workable. But I believe that we, we have matured since then. Um, and so we're trying to find a way. Um, 
that we can ensure that shelters are being able to be refreshed and cleaned and some of those things that you just need time to do while making sure that we're maintaining, especially for those who are moving through any level of crisis, mental health, who have children, uh, who have any level of disability, that we're also making sure that that is a practice that we're not um, having as a, uh, a macro operations across the entire shelter system. Um, trying to answer you very honestly, but I hope that it is an artifact that we can move away um, from soon. Thank you um, for that. Um, Ms. Isom, the budget request is $24 million um, in the categories that you've highlighted just a little bit, but for uh, folks who are just tuning in, they do include winter warming center operations, homelessness prevention, um, funding for pregnant women, additional funding for shelters, conversion of family shelters to non-congregate shelters, street outreach, flexible funding, and system operations. Um, can you speak to homelessness prevention and what is CSB's role in this and how do you plan uh, to actually execute prevention? It is interesting. The more that I study the... Um uh, the communities, the cities very specifically who are struggling with the exact same thing that we are, what they will tell you is the more people that house, the more people that move into homelessness. Mm -hmm. It is a, a continuous cycle that I'm not uh, certain yet that any particular city has really um, wrapped their strategic arms around. So what we do know that has worked really well within this community hasn't worked really well in others, but it's worked really well in this community, is prevention dollars do work. Uh, here's why I believe they work in this community. Um, on average, the benchmark is that you don't know who you're preventing. You have to spend um, prevention dollars on four families to ensure that one is actually prevented from moving into the system. But those numbers aren't good. And that there are no specific correlative variables that you can look to see which is the one. Yet, um, in our five year, close to five year uh, time of us doing prevention, what we found is that 92% success rate, and out of that 92%, 76% were head of household black women. I would tell you then that tool works for that particular cohort. I'd like to keep it. I'd like to sustain it and move it out of this idea of being a pilot, and it is our process, and that it must be layered with other practices. I think that why we continue to maybe move back a little bit on our heels is because we don't have a comma and, comma and, comma and strategy. It must be. I would, um, I've nested prevention um, as uh, a process, a practice, I would even say a policy, as we say that we're moving to net functional zero of family homelessness. Why? 92% of our head of households um, in our shelter system are black moms. We've moved up in the last year since I've been here from 2.8 children to 3.3. That number is increasing. Moms age are decreasing. Ages are decreasing. And so we have to figure out how do we use these prevention dollars and then wrap them around to with some dollars that I need uh, to, to do what, what we're calling non-congregate. What we know, what we know we know, is that families, head of household with children, spend a long time in shelter. What we also know is that when there are non-congregate spaces, that time speeds up, and we're saying going from well over 200 days to 40. 40, that is a huge return. What we have found from uh, Sawyer Tower and what we're finding from Colonial Village is that we know how to use hotels, and we know how to do wraparound services quickly around hotels. Let's not just use that uh, for emergency, and let's think proactively about it and nest it in strategy. All of that is in number four. Finally, we have an amazing partner in Celebrate One with a brand new leader. And I'm excited about not only our partnership, uh, but the way that we are thinking about how to uh, not make $1 stretch 
but make $1 uh, plus their dollar match for an economy of scale. I believe that we can again nest those goals of celebrate one right in here. And we can do the comma and, comma and. And I think then this community can start seeing some differences. Then finally, I know I'm talking a little too long. We have private uh, partners that are excited about uh, prevention dollars. And I think that if we see administration, the county, council also equally as excited about moving to net zero, we will see prevention dollars not be a pilot, but really be the process in which Franklin County moves. Thank you for that. If I, if I could add, you know, uh, emergency rental assistance, you know, is added into this homeless prevention camp uh, to the tune of $70 million that's been dispersed over the last three years uh, to ensure that people could remain properly housed when we don't have enough housing to accommodate the folks that already are here. I think what you're also, um, what I'm hearing is confirmation of what I know to be true um, and to this notion that our housing problem is not just a Columbus problem, it's a regional problem. When I think about homelessness, it's not just a housing problem. We have to think of all the other systemic levers that are not being pulled, that are truly going to bring equity into this conversation. So whether we're talking about a living wage job or access to quality education or workforce development, all of these levers need to be firing off at the same time to ensure that we address um, this crisis in our community. Someone asked the question of me just last week, what's it gonna take? What's it gonna take for us to cure homelessness in Columbus? And so uh, it's a loaded question, uh, but I'm gonna lay that at your, at your feet as well. Uh, because I have my, my own uh, sentiment around this, but uh, today on one of the coldest days of the year that we had, um, I think it's incredibly important for us to be as candid as we can uh, with the community uh, to demonstrate that we're not running, we're not hiding from this issue, we're facing it um, you know, head on, uh, but we know we don't have all of the answers, right? Uh, but from a professional's uh, standpoint, what is it gonna take? Thank you again, Councilwoman Favor, to have the opportunity to answer. I, I, let me first concur that it is a loaded question, and, and I want to caution us that it is not any one answer. Mm -hmm. um, last week, uh, I was on a panel with um, mm -hmm. Bob Weiler, and he said that number one thing that we need, and I agree, is we need the will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, must, we must believe we can do it. Mm -hmm. We must believe we can do it. I believe we can. The second, uh, and I'm gonna pull no punches, is that it, we must make the investment. Mm -hmm. uh, we, must, we must consider housing as an essential service. And then thirdly, um, I'm um, be as transparent as I can, we must, build 30% and under housing. Mm -hmm. I am ready to run, walk, sit or crawl to find anyone that will partner with us on that. Um, but that's a risk, but we must, we must. Um, I can keep going, but those are my top three. Thank you, Ms. Isom, um, for your, your time uh, this evening. Uh, we will go ahead and move um, on to our next invited guest, uh, who is Kelly Harrop, with, who is representing the building industry of Central Ohio. Welcome back to a uh, city council. Uh, Council President Hardin, Chair Favor, Vice Chair Green, thank you for inviting us out to testify about the importance of creating housing in the city of Columbus tonight. My name is Kelly Harrop and I am the Government Affairs Manager for the Building Industry Association of Central Ohio. The Building Industry Association of Central Ohio has represented the Columbus region's residential development construction industry for over 81 years. BIA members include developers, builders, professional design services, subcontractors, and suppliers. It is no secret the city of Columbus is facing a housing crisis. 
We applaud the efforts of council taking a multifaceted approach to ease the struggle many Columbus residents are facing by passing progressive and much needed legislation to make all types of housing easier to build and more accessible. This legislation includes, but is not limited to, the citywide CRA, cooperation with developers on city bond issues, and updating the zoning code. But please allow me to provide some context as to why we need to keep our foot on the gas pedal and continue to do more to ease these struggles. One need lo look no further than the economic forecast of Dr. Bill Lafayette shared with the Columbus Metropolitan Club earlier this month to understand the scale of the need for all types of housing in Central Ohio. The Central Ohio region added approximately 10,300 jobs in 2023 alone. Columbus is also expected to grow exponentially, adding an anticipated 375, three, 357,000 new jobs by 2050, which equates to approximately 1 million residents residing in the Columbus metropolitan area. Additional residents, sorry. One of my favorite quotes I've learned during my brief time with the BIA is a home is where the job goes to sleep at night. Let's take a moment, unpack that together. In the early 2000s, Columbus was adding approximately 16,000 new units to market each year, with 20% less population than what we have now. In 2023, we added approximately 11,000 units. One only need have a basic understanding of supply and demand to understand the alarming disparity that exists in today's market. This will only be compounded given the growth of the region. The BIA estimates that by 2032, housing permitting must increase approximately twofold from recent trends to meet projected housing needs of, the one of, of over 100,000 new housing units in the next decade. Fast forward even more to 2050, in combination with projected job growth, there is an estimated need for 272,000 new housing units. Simply put, we do not have enough available units to meet the growing needs of Central Ohio residents. Growth is an exciting problem for this region nonetheless, but nonetheless a problem. In, Central, in the Central Ohio region, the compounded annual growth rate in home, home price is more than three times the compounded annual growth rate in median household income. What does that mean? Simply put, 70% of American households cannot afford a market rate house. Let's localize that even further. In 2023, it was estimated over 52,000 Columbus residents were spending over 50% of their income on housing. This even goes beyond the definition of being housing burdened, which is spending more than 30% of one's salary on housing. Based on all the aforementioned statistics, one would think the solution is simple, right? build more houses. But if it were so simple, and we know the demand is there, why aren't we seeing an increase in supply and how do we solve this problem? If I have learned anything in my six months as the government affairs manager at the BIA, it is that it is incredibly hard to build housing units of all kinds in Central Ohio, from affordable units to workplace housing to luxury housing to senior housing, developers are facing barriers. In 2023 alone, the cost of construction materials increased by a whopping 19%, and in addition to increased material cost, a growing city is often, a growing city is often competing statewide for a limited number of housing tax credits that are often relegated to rural cities with larger amounts of poverty. Without things such as the expansion of the citywide CRA, projects for our developers simply do not pencil out. More than anyone, this hurts emerging, small, and minority developers who simply cannot afford the increased costs without some sort of governmental assistance. Another reason housing is hard to build is due to exclusionary zoning and a general NIMBY sentiment that we are seeing in Columbus neighborhoods. Many projects are getting caught up in tedious bureaucratic approval and variance processes needed to even get shovels in the ground. As we all know, Time is money, and this certainly applies to housing creation. The more a project is held up, the more regulatory requirements are, the more expensive housing becomes. This again is hurting our emerging small business and minority developers who simply do not have the funds to weather a bureaucratic storm. We would like to commend the council 
uh, the mayor's office through building and zoning director Scott Messer for finding ways to streamline this process and expedite reviews of reviews and inspections. In conclusion, we have a housing problem in Columbus. There is an increasing demand for housing with stagnant wages and not enough market supply. We must redouble our efforts for all of our activity to date has yet to achieve the outcome of more housing. We commend the city for taking progressive and creative approaches to solve the problem and appreciate a seat at the table to continue to work to find additional solutions that are needed to address this problem. We all share a belief that each and every resident in the city of Columbus deserves to have a safe and affordable res residence to come home to each night. And we look forward to working with you to help materialize this goal. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harrop, and thank you for that testimony uh, this evening. Uh, you mentioned a couple of uh, impediments to building more housing units uh, in Columbus and, and across the region. Um, do you believe that the landscape has changed over the course of the last year, or do we see it getting worse? I think we are developing less units than we have traditionally, and you're seeing this um, compound from a lot of factors, whether it be rising wages, uh, labor costs, whether it be the cost of the materials to build, um, but there are also tangible things we can do, such as streamlining regulation pro processes um, that we really commend the city on leading the way on. Um, candidly, the city of Columbus uh, has one of the more streamlined processes, and I know a lot of the times that's something our developers appreciate, um, is going in with a sense of predictability leads to quicker, uh, the quicker ability to get shovels in the ground and build these housing units that we know we need. At speaking of um, streamlined processes, uh, just this past December, we did pass a citywide CRA policy. Uh, do you believe that uh, will have a positive impact on getting more units into the ground quicker? Yes, um, I was actually just talking to one of our contractors, uh, a small minority contractor, uh, and he Explain to me that the citywide CRA is the difference between him completing a project and not completing a project. And more specifically, the ability for him as a small and emerging business to not have to sell that parcel to someone who can't afford to pay those mm. fees. So when we talk about creating equitable ground in the ability to produce housing, I think the citywide CRA has a huge impact on that and allows more people to get involved in the game, which ultimately leads to our goal of creating more units. Thank you for that. Are there additional questions for Ms. Harrop by my colleagues tonight? Thank you for your testimony this evening and thank you for the continued partnership with the BIA. We will, or I will now turn it over to Council Member Green who will run the next portion of our hearing. Council Member Green. Thank you everyone uh, for sticking with us tonight. I know this is a all very, very important topics. Um, I'm gonna save um, a lot of the kind of formal remarks. We did a lot of that at the beginning and I know we really wanna get, just have the opportunity to dive in. Um, I did want to um, call attention to, so the second portion of the budget hearing, uh, the purpose of this portion is to review and comment on the mayor's proposed 2024 operating budget with a focus on those departments and offices that impact our city's health, human services, and equity spaces. Um, the departments that we will be discussing today primarily are Columbus Public Health and Celebrate One with uh, total budgets of $45,441,705. And we want to thank our colleagues again. We want to thank uh, Director Stevens uh, for sticking in with us um, and um, Assistant Health Commissioner Anita Clark as well as um, our um, Executive Director of Celebrate One, Danielle Tong, um, and uh, Melinda Cunningham, the Assistant Director of Celebrate One, uh, for being here today. Um, so at this point in time, I will um, ask if Shayla has any comments. No? <laughs> um, and then I would like to welcome um, fellow social worker um, and public health extraordinaire, Assistant Health Commissioner Anita Clark, to um, discuss the 2024 proposed budget for public health. Good evening. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Council Member Green. It's so funny to say that, but uh, welcome so. home. Um, <laughs> and I just want to uh, thank you, President Hardin and uh, Chair Faber as well. Um, 
really want the opportunity tonight to just highlight Columbus Public Health's uh, proposed 2024 budget of $43,453,336 to protect the health and safety of our community and the residents we serve. This budget includes just under $33.5 million for personnel costs, including 331 full-time and 20 part-time staff. We are proud that our workforce is more diverse than the community average based on the U.S. Census. Um, and just as an example, in mid-2023, Hispanic and Latino persons accounted for 5% of Columbus Public Health employees compared to 4% in the community. African American employees also made up 29% of workforce compared to 13% in the community. While our budget slightly decreased from 2023 by a little less than $9,000, we've been very fortunate to supplement our funds from uh, federal and, and state dollars, uh, which equals to about $32 million. So we're seeking, continuing to seek grants um, as we move along and look at our budget. We must continue to be progressive in funding for workforce retention and sustainability. We talked about that. Our budget reflects an increase in personnel of over 1.4 million to be able to do that. So we're really looking to see how we can secure our employees, uh, certainly, especially after the pandemic. Additionally, our continued investigation and management of disease outbreaks such as COVID-19, MPOX, and measles necessitates our continued staffing to protect our community. Our population health division, which houses that work, um, is budgeted at a little over 4.7 million. We continue to see a decline in our COVID-19 grant funding, so we really need to be strategic in what our operations are gonna look like, but we continually need to be prepared for another pandemic if it should arise, but we're constantly having to balance that. The environment, Environmental Health Division of 67 employees protects the community by preventing and reducing risk from environmental hazards from food, water, air, animals, vectors, ha hazardous materials, and waste. We added 1.5 FT to this division to assist with our flavored tobacco ban enforcement, which kicks off this month. A total of over $7 million has been budgeted sup to support this work um, in Columbus. Likewise, a favorite for you, uh, Chair Green, the Alcohol and Addiction Services Program provides important treatment, education, and prevention. SafePoint, funded at $350,000, also offers comprehensive harm reduction um, education uh, to the community about safe drug use and also the spread of infection and testing. We have a medication-assisted uh, treatment program as well for $50,000. And then a large part of addiction services, if you look at it, you think, oh, you know, that's not a ton of money at $1.8 million for our operating budget. We do have funds from Adam H. that assist us to bridge that gap. We are very excited, and this is kind of my passion area here, is our anti-violence programs. Our, our budget um, includes over $5.2 million for our neighborhood social service uh, teams which links residents to trauma support and resources to build a stronger, safer, and more resilient community. We'll be, we will be launching a media campaign with public safety highlighting all of our alternative response teams, and that should be here soon. So I'm excited uh, that that's going to be happening. And then we have our right response unit, which is our social workers in our 911 call center, and then our social workers that ride along with our police officers as well. We really want to look at that right response for our community. Um, I'm very excited that our dashboard went live recently. Actually, we did some tweaks last week to the web page, and that's new, which highlights some of the work that our RRU and our mobile crisis response teams complete so that our whole community can look at this web page and see the numbers, who we're serving, where we're serving them at, and also interactive so if they have questions about those teams, they can actually email or, or ask for further information if they need to. Um, additionally, we have a contract with a minority vendor for uh, $75,000 to provide culturally sensitive counseling for the community and, and, and provide group counseling. And we really did this through our care coalition and our work knowing that we really needed to meet the needs of our community. Um, so that, that is in our budget now. And then I want to talk a little bit about our gun, um, our, our 
lock boxes, our gun lock boxes. We have budgeted $36,000 um, for this. And just recently, we have hit the 5200 mark, where we actually provided 5200 lock boxes to our community. And then if you haven't seen on TV, we have a commercial that actually highlights a media campaign that highlights our gun safety, and it features some of our very own CPH superstars and our staff. So take a look at that. I think it's pretty impressive. Um, we're very honored also to lead our city's efforts to address racism as a public health crisis. Our Center for Public Health Innovation is addressing the social determinants of health to achieve health equity for all residents. Over 3.2 million has been allocated for this work in this year's budget. As part of our equity work, Columbus Public Health acquired the Undesigned the Red Line exhibit to provide awareness and training. We also launched a Healthy Children and Safe Homes by 2024 initiative to, to look at lead and to provide outreach and education, screening and testing, workforce development and repairs and remediation to prevent all children from being lead poisoned. And I'm kind of looking around the room now. You know, we're partnering with development. We're partnering with building and zoning, um, also public utilities to do this initiative. So we're very excited about that. Our propo proposed budget also includes an increase of $75,000 for interpretation services to reduce barriers and provide equitable care that best serves our clients for a little over $370,000. Um, you may have noted this past year, in 2023, we did a couple modifications to those contracts, and I think we're going to have to look at that this year again, and we may have to increase that number and do some modifications as we see how we best serve our clients. I know that we're doing a lot of education with our employees to, to do our tele-interpretation uh, services. We also have what's called a MARTI system that's a kind of a wheeled system where we can actually... Um, provide a laptop to do that um, exchange. So it's really some neat services that we offer there. So uh, we'll just have to keep our no eye on the number uh, this coming year. Additionally, our primary care services is budgeted um, just under 4.3 million. In 2023, a portion of the funding was allocated to six of federally qualified health centers, um, which we'll plan to do in 2024. And then by 2027, that whole pot of 4.3 million will be distributed equally amongst the FQHC based on the amount of clients that they see in the county. So it'll be equitable in, um, throughout um, all the FQHCs, and that's qualified centers too. As always, we appreciate the support and partnership of City Council in this process and all year long as we continue our work and on behalf of all the residents, uh, we wanna keep them safe. I would be very happy to answer any questions you may have, and thank you. Thank you so much, Assistant Health Commissioner. Um, so I do have a couple of questions, and then I'll turn it over to the colleagues. Um, the, um, so the first question, and I, I think I will hold myself accountable in terms of equity also. I had asked uh, dress, Director Stevens a question about flat funding of an external program, and um, I also wanted to ask the same similar question about SafePoint. Um, I know the $350,000 allocation with $150,000 from the county funds that organization primarily, and that was the amount that we budgeted in 2019. Was it 2019? Um, and so thinking about equity, thinking about, um, thinking about inflation since 2019, increased cost of services, um, do you feel like that amount of funding is sufficient to be able to meet the needs for the organization or um, have there been ongoing conversations about, about an, an increased need um, we, there have been some discussions about it. We put this out to bid this year, and that was our, uh, our really our first time to do that. Um, and unfortunately, that we only had one bidder um, for the work, and so um, it did meet the the it met the the needs of the three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. There wasn't a we can't do that service, um, but we can continue those those that dialogue. Um, but I, I hear you. Inflation is tough. You know, getting employees, the cost of supplies. I mean, it's all going up. Well, again, and again, also because of the 
it's a, it's a very similar population. A lot of crossover, I think. The week of walk-ins, they were saying a third of the uh, individuals who came in seeking support for substance use disorder uh, also identified as being um, un unsheltered or unhoused right now. And so mm -hmm. um, there's the correlation, but we know it's relationship is a big part of that too, which is why Safe Point um, and those outreach programs have been so successful. So retaining that workforce um, is, it's, I think it's just an issue across the board. We're all in the same boat, at least together. Um, thank you so much. And then the second question that I had um, was around um, the, sorry, I've got too many papers. This is my first time, we're still learning. Um, also, in, in line with the alcohol and drugs, drug services, so I noticed there's like a full-time employee that was lost from this year, and but still the budget continued to increase um, by slightly, maybe 75K or something around there. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the difference in those costs and if, um, if you feel like our workforce is meeting the needs? Um, you know, I think Columbus Public Health does such an exceptional job, not just with harm reduction stuff, but our alcohol and drug services will provide services regardless of ability to pay. And so it's a big gap um, and want to make sure that that program's properly resourced too. Sure. Um, when we were building the budget this year, we really looked at um, our grant funding and we really try, if we have funding available, we do some shifting in grant work versus the operating fund. And so some of the, when you look at that, you think, oh, they shifted. More than, you know, likely they probably went on to that grant. I'd have to do some research, but I'm almost 100% sure uh, they went on to additional grant funding that was available. Okay, awesome. Um, sure. And then the last question, I think for now, um, is related to the alternate crisis work, mm -hmm. um, which um, is just incredible um, to see some of the early feedback from the pilots that have been happening. And we know, um, much like across the spectrum of our community services system, this is also a service that um, doesn't just need to grow today to meet the current capacity need, but also looking down the road as Columbus grows, would you know, hypothetically need to grow um, incrementally with our population. And so I'm curious to know, um, I know funds are falling both under CPH as well as under public safety. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to know, um, there's a lot changing in the crisis continuum landscape right now. Um, we have the MRSS service that was just, um, came out from, you know, Ohio Moss. And, um, and then similarly, I think any day now, although they've been saying for a while, our, our uh, mobile crisis services that will be t targeted towards adult populations. And those services are reimbursable. Um, and we have licensed clinicians that would be eligible to perform those services. So are we exploring, as we know there's gonna be a need to scale the program, the possibilities of um, you know, tapping into some of those resources and billing for some of those services to help stretch our investment, not to reduce our investment in the program, but to help make our investment go further down the road? I, I think certainly we need to look at that. Um, I think that, you know, one thing now that we've launched the mobile crisis response team, and I know that that's, you know, certainly can be billable. We, we need to look at that, but we also need to look at, um, not hinging a funding source to that as well. And I, and I think that, um, you know, we need to meet the community where they're at. Um, so I want, you know, I would want to explore that more. And I was looking at that just the other day with, you know, Medicaid regulations. I mean, there are things that we could be billing for, um, whether it's a, you know, co-responder with a police officer and a social worker, or if it's a complete social work team. Um, so I, I think we, we have a lot to learn from the teams that are out there in our community right now. They're growing. Um, I know NetCare has their team. Nationwide, Nationwide Children has their team. Um, so I really want to learn from them to find out what they're doing um, before we implement anything. But I think it's, it's well worth our investment. Awesome. I would love to support those conversations um, continuing. And actually I did, I was dishonest. I do have one um, more question and you might not have an answer for it today, but I at least wanted to, um, to address it. So um, 
it, we have the opiate settlement fund money that has started coming in. Mm -hmm. And I was curious, um, especially in light of the fact that we know that we have a lot of needs in the community. Mm -hmm. We have um, an alcohol and drug services budget that's around the, whatever the 1.8 million, I think it is that we've received so far. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not suggesting that we would need to to switch out funding sources. Maybe we could fund a different program or thinking about if there is a plan because we also know in the alcohol and drug um, services space, there is also greater need probably than what currently is being invested in, not just by the city, but you know across the system. Um, and so if we have, um, have started looking at a plan for how we can strategically bridge gaps um, in our, uh, across the continuum with our services. Actually, we've been talking about it a lot. Um, it. And of course, you know, I know I'm a social worker, but I also have a finance brain. So I'm thinking, okay, how can we maximize and sustain our staffing that we have? And I know talking to the administrator in the addiction services, she's concerned about the funding we have from, you know, county and, and federal funding. You know, when you are looking at cost of living and you do increases, if they just exactly what you talked about, flat fund, how do you make that difference up? And so, you know, we're talking about maybe, you know, using those funds for a couple um, counselors. I think that makes a lot of sense. And then we're having discussions about the Terra bags. And those are bags, if you don't know what those are, are bags that actually dissolve an opioid or a, a pain medication. So um, if anybody has that medication at home, they can put it in this bag and it destroy, destroys the medication so no one can use it and it's not effective. Mm -hmm. um, recently, I, I thought this was amazing. Uh, the pharmacy, CVS, gave away a small deterra bag when they gave a pain medication uh, to somebody that worked at CPH. And she actually showed us that. Uh, small little deterra bag. So we're talking about maybe using some kind of initiative. Mm -hmm. um, I know that Adam H has been such great partners with us, and they do some deterra bag distribution through Franklin County, um, but I'm not sure how much our residents know about it. Mm -hmm. um, so that may be something that we look at as well. And I think, too, we talked about the REACT team. Even though it's not part of Columbus Public Health, we partner so much for FIRE that that may be an, an, opp an opportunity mm -hmm. as well. Wonderful. Um, that's all for me. Um, I'll turn it over to our vice chair of this committee. Just a few questions. Thank you, uh, Chair Green. Uh, while we're here uh, around um, safety, uh, there are many efforts to address gun violence and mm -hmm. uh, alternative crisis response that's coming out of the Columbus Public Health Department. Why are those efforts coming from uh, Columbus Public Health and uh, not where we would uh, traditionally think they would be uh, coming out of, like Public Safety Department? Um, I think it takes all of us, and I think that we have the expertise as far as our social social workers and our counselors and they have a different view. And it's been a wonderful collaboration with public mm -hmm. safety. I can't say that enough, that we have worked together and they've had insight on things where our counselors have had insight and it's just a really awesome team to see them work together. So I think it takes all of us. Wonderful. And then my last question, uh, December 2022, we successfully passed a ban on flavored tobacco in the city of Columbus, which went into effect on the first day of this year. Mm -hmm. Can you share any update on this and what investments are being made uh, or being included, excuse me, by CPH to continue this work? Right. Um, we are in full action right now. Mm -hmm. um, we actually had a Board of Health meeting today and talked about the number of inspections that they're doing. Um, and they're going out. I think there's 850 vendors in the community. And so they've done, for the year of 2023, there was about 1,900 site visits that were made and, 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 and with and permitting that happened or checks that happened, and I'm not saying that completely correct, um, but what it says is that when someone has sold to somebody that they shouldn't sell to, we go back and do education to them. So that's a second touch base. And then, you know, the, by the third time, if it happens again, then there's a fine that um, happens. And so we're doing our best effort to get out there. Um, I think our goal is to keep our community safe mm -hmm. and also really to keep out the flavored tobacco out of young children's hands. And I think that we need to continue that effort. And I know there's a lot of legislative things that are going on right now, but we're going to continue the work um, until, you know, until we're told we can't. Thank you for that. Thank sure. you, Chair Green. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. 
No, I, I was I no questions. I was excited to hear about the work that's being done with Alternative Crisis. Con, uh, council Member uh, Favor uh, kind of uh, pitched it for me in, in the question. I think we we're, we're excited to see more of that work uh, being done uh, through the lens of, of the social work side and the health side. And um, just look forward to continue to be a partner as we all like amplify that work. Thank you. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I think that's. I think that's all from us. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, we will now transition uh, to learn more about Celebrate One's operating budget uh, proposal. And um, Executive Director Tong, the floor is uh, yours. Welcome to Council. Thank you very much, Council President Hardin. Uh, Council Member Favor, Council Member Green, thank you very much for the opportunity to share with you our 2024 budget. Um, today, we are going to take a few steps back and talk a little bit about um, who Celebrate One is and how we um, became who we are today. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Deputy Director Cunningham to start that. Thank you, Director Tong. So each year in Franklin County, 150 babies die before their first birthday and twice, of, twice as many African-American babies are likely to die as white babies. In Columbus, these deaths are concentrated in the neighborhoods in which we are, <laughs> in, in which we, <laughs> sorry. These, our neighborhoods um, lose four times as many babies as in the neighborhoods next door to them. This is a community crisis and it's been addressed as such. And in 2013, the Greater Columbus Infant Mortality Task Force was commissioned. This was a diverse and knowledgeable panel to study why our infants are dying and what we can do about it. In 2014, with a group of dedicated partners, Columbus launched the Celebrate One initiative, prioritizing those neighborhoods where infant mortality rates are the highest and where we can have the greatest impact to save these young lives. Mayor Ginther elevated our work by moving our initiative into the mayor's office where we currently reside. In Linden, the near south side, the near east side, the hilltop, Franklinton, the northeast or southeast, and in Northland. Celebrate One is working to educate, engage, and enlist residents as advocates and ambassadors on this issue. So just to give you an idea about the leading causes of infant death, this graphic identifies the majority of infant death as we have determined through um, many of the studies and partners that we have in, in the space that prematurity is the leading factor, uh, followed then by sleep-related deaths, and then congenital or other types of issues medically that we can't control is in that smaller slice. Many of the premature births we find are directly impacted through the social determinants of health. These include having access to education, quality health care, economic stability, socialhood, and neighborhood infrastructure. So Celebrate One, uh, we've included our mission, our vision, and our goals uh, in this slide to convey to you what Celebrate One is engaged in presently. So our mission currently is that we are a place-based collective impact initiative founded to reduce infant mortality and improve health equity so that more babies in Franklin County and in the city of Columbus reach their first birthday. You can see our goal there, uh, which Director Tong will speak to in, in greater detail, but our vision is that every baby deserves to celebrate his or her first birthday, regardless of race, location in the city, or their family's income. So I wanted to address our funding to kind of give you a, a little bit more backstory about how Celebrate One has resources to achieve our work. We have over $6 million under management currently, 30% of which comes from the city's general fund, which is what we're gonna discuss in a moment. 70% of our work is covered through grant funding. Our grant partners include the state of Ohio, 
Franklin County, and the federal government. We also have additional private donations from corporate partners, as well as private citizens and other, uh, other groups throughout Columbus. When they want to donate, there is a 501c3 in which they can donate those funds. But our primary grant funding comes from all of our government partners. Maybe. <laughs> so the general fund ask for Celebrate One this year is uh, $1,988,369. The lion's share of that is the personnel expense for 2024 of just over $1.5 million. This $1.5 million funds 13 full-time employees that is primarily made up of our leadership and our program staff. These are the folks that are actually managing, applying for grants, and allowing us to have that funding from the Gerald Fund to manage that additional 70% of our grant funding. Uh, our materials and supply budget is at 20,000. Services remain fairly steady. And then grants and sponsorships at 25,000. These would be sponsorships or grants to other city um, partners that have some type of work within the infant mortality space. Um, although it's hard to read, our organization chart is, is identified. Uh, the green squares are those employees within Celebrate One who are grant funded versus the clear squares which are funded through the general fund. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Executive Director Tong for the remaining of information about our budget. So I, so I would like to share a few highlights from 2023. There are some things that I'm very proud of with Celebrate One from 2023. Um, and many of them are listed here on the slide. We connected with 3,000 women and families. Um, we successfully held five outreach events that are quite large and have a large footprint. Um, I'm most proud of the fact that we handed out 985 pregnancy tests in partnership with Columbus Metropolitan Libraries. Um, and even with all of that movement, Celebrate One has experienced tremendous change over 2023. Um, with the transition of both a deputy director and exec executive director. Um, so my position here has been within the last six months and the development of our team uh, continues to grow uh, to meet the need. I wanna spend some time on our plans for 2024. Celebrate One has a big mission. It is to reduce the infant mortality rate here in Central Ohio. Um, and we, we focus our work in 13 zip codes that are our priority zip codes. We know that the rate in those zip codes has largely not moved. And so the work for this year is to figure out why. Answer that question. So Celebrate One is interested in a community assessment of those specific 13 C1 priority areas. Um, a really close to the ground assessment so that we can understand those zip codes. We also look to expand the education of our community health workforce, community health worker workforce. So that professional development um, entails a more intensive community um, case management training in addition to voter registration training to help them meet the ongoing needs of our families in the community. Right now, our community health workers are um, seeing cases in a shorter duration than we find the need calls for and that they need a longer term relationship with families. So we are increasing our skill set in order to do that. Additionally, Celebrate One looks forward to um, investments in data collection and analysis software that will help us understand our outcomes and better be able to present those outcomes to the community. 
um, we look forward to increasing our partnership with residents in those 13 zip codes. So we're currently well connected with the organizations that serve residents in our 13 zip codes. But I propose that we could be closer to the residents themselves to learn more about their needs and their work and how they would like to see us show up in their communities. We also plan to expand the uh, work of a black women's coalition building group called Queens Village. Uh, Celebrate One has a chapter of Queens Village um, which originally hailed from Cincinnati. And essentially this group pulls together black women to build power for that group of folks. And essentially what that does is allow black women to have a seat at the table for decisions made about their health care. Now, um, the focus for these groups are for the 13 zip codes that we serve to make sure that each of those zip codes actually do have representation in that group. We are very excited about bringing on a staff member. Um, she starts in just another week or so, a director of policy that will help us craft our uh, policy agenda in partnership with Cincinnati and Cleveland so that we can advance the work of infant maternal health statewide. Um, we also look forward to this role because part of her responsibility is to help us lean into um, education of the families that we serve around policies that affect them um, and around how to register to vote. So with her um, involvement, we will be able to infuse voter registration in all of our programming. Um, we also look forward to the opportunity to expand our current housing program. Um, we currently have a housing program that is closed to enrollment right now, but we look forward to reopening enrollment um, as we develop a plan that really suits the specific needs of birthing families. We have a position open right now called the Housing Stability Manager, um, and that would be the person who is accountable to the day-to-day -day operations of that program to ensure that we are um, advancing a program that really benefits uh, birthing families. Those are a lot of plans for 2024, but I'm feeling very, very encouraged um, to do this work. I think we have an incredible staff that I am still getting to know, but I have been very fortunate to come to love in just the very short time that I've been in this role. One of the things that I would like to um, share with you, oh, here's the clicker. Okay. One of the things that I would like to impress upon the council today is the um, portion of the general fund that Celebrate One receives um, really allows us to do all of the rest of the work that we do. We have uh, the great fortune of having our general operations essentially covered, and that is a wonderful blessing. It allows us to raise funds and do put feet to the ground on providing physical needs, such as baby items, cribs, car seats, um, providing resources like housing, food, and transportation, um, in meeting prenatal needs like pregnancy tests, prenatal care, doula, home visitors, and mental health care. But we actually do more than that. So those are the things that meet the direct uh, needs of our patients, of our clients. But we do so much more. We uh, partner with Columbus Public Health to actualize recommendations that they provide our entire community on how to reduce infant infant mortality. Uh, that group is called the Community Action Team, and you'll hear more about it across the year 2024. Um, we also leverage this general fund and the staff members that we have that are funded by it to apply for funds across the state and then distribute those dollars to community-based organizations in Central Ohio. So organizations that would otherwise not have access to funds like that, we leverage our position to be able to do that for them. That really diversifies the pool of funding um, and the folks that are meeting the needs of our families. 
And finally, um, a responsibility that we hold in the community is that we are the keeper of the messaging around infant maternal health. Um, and so in 2024, we look forward to leaning into that responsibility and br bringing unification around the messaging of infant maternal health in all of its causes and all of the preventative factors um, that gives us a common vocabulary and way forward. And with that, we are delighted to take questions. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for the incredible work you're doing. Um, I have been t to help uh, distribute on the first birthday celebrations before, and it's just um, it's a beautiful thing to see the impact um, that this program is having for people that um, are certainly experienced hardship. Um, so a uh, question for that, is that 20K line item that was in the budget up there, is that the line item, the supplies line item for like the diapers and the pack and plays? No, okay, so that's just embedded in the budget then. Yes, okay. so we do fundraising, external fundraising oh. for our baby showers. Okay. Um, there is a line item in the uh, general fund that supports um, essentially um, an event planner that helps us do these because they're very large scale events. <laughs> Um, but the materials there you see are cost of doing business, paper, pens, copy, toner, et cetera. Gotcha. That is wonderful. Um, and then the only other question I had mm -hmm. was about the expansion of the after school program. Or not, I'm sorry, summer program. Summer Housing? Is there a summer youth program in the... Oh, there is a... A teen reproductive health program? Yes. yes. It says the 2024 budget includes an expansion of $150,000 to fund a summer youth employment program. Yes. Um, in conjunction with Planned Parenthood of Greater Ohio. Yes, I can speak to that. Um, this past summer, 2023, um, we received a request from the mayor's office to assist in funding the 2023 program. And so that program went so well in educating um, those high school students and young adults in a variety of topics, including um, how to create a resume, how to source a job. And there is a heavy component in that on teen reproductive health and being able to be an ambassador amongst their peers for sharing reproductive information Oftentimes, uh, someone of that age feels embarrassed to talk to a parent or a nurse or a doctor, but they can talk to a peer. Mm -hmm. And so part of that curriculum was to get real evidence-based teen reproductive health data out to that, that group of people. Oh, awesome. Thank that sounds great. Um, the question that I had related to that was... Um, about transportation to and from that program for youth in the summer found in my experience that to be a, a large barrier with sometimes reaching um, the folks that we really, really need to be reaching. Um, and so I was curious if in that budget request there's any um, transportation built into that um, to help support people getting to and from the program. I would have to dig into what we did in 2023. Um, the request for 2024 was made um, similarly. Okay. Um, I believe there is a transportation component. Okay. It's just that gets handled from Plant Parenthood directly. Oh. And we are basically the sponsor of the program. So they run the curriculum as well as then report back to us. So I can certainly find out for you and I can circle back and let you know. Okay, yeah. Well, I'm just looking forward to learning more in general. Um, that was all that I had um, from myself. Anything from my colleagues? Thank you, um, Chair Green. So, uh, despite our efforts to educate and increase our resources, we continue to see a rise in infant mortality statewide uh, and maternal mortality and in Columbus, especially among black infants. And so um, it is concerning for me uh, to see uh, the line item um, that reflects $400,000 uh, designated towards services, understanding that um, that's only designated uh, for grant uh, general fund, excuse me, mm -hmm. general fund funds, um, and that there are grant funds. 
So uh, question here being of the grant funds that are collected, uh, do we know uh, what percentage is going to services at this time? Or does all of it go to services? So nearly all of it is going to services. There is maybe uh, out of the, the six million that we have under our direct supervision, there's probably less than, I wanna say less than 80,000 that's used for any type of um, internal processing. Everything else is either a direct pass through to one of our partners so that they can um, participate in the work and do the community outreach that our staff cannot do just because of the volume of pregnant African-American women in our community that need those services. Um, we can certainly get a more specific number for you, but essentially many of those grant partners are uh, through the Ohio Department of Health, uh, also the Ohio Department of Medicaid, and so all of those grants are set up so that we receive the funding, but then we distribute that funding out to our grant partners as well as to our own community health worker staff so that they can also meet the needs of those clients. So very little is funneled anywhere other than direct services. I appreciate that um, explanation. We know that this is centered around the lack of health equity. We know this is centered around medical racism. I have experienced it as a black woman uh, who has seeked medical um, health care. And so um, it is concerning to, 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 to know that, number one, our numbers continue to rise. Um, number two, that we're, we're going to engage in another uh, community assessment uh, of why these numbers continue to reflect um, these alarming, uh, at these alarming rates. Um, Council Member uh, Bankston and I have been intentional about investing, uh, making amendments to the budget every year to invest in proven strategies like doula care that have a more specialized uh, care uh, that is provided to families, uh, particularly families of color. And so uh, I guess the question is uh, here, are we looking at investing in some of these proven strategies that we know are specifically targeted to um, uh, to certain groups uh, that have been um, uh, positive, uh, have, have proven, have provided positive results, excuse me. And then are we exploring partnerships with hospital systems to elevate um, this conversation to another level? Uh, because once again, Celebrate One, is, is it has a specific role but you all are not going to be in the hospital systems, the, 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 the maternity wards, excuse me. And so how are we ringing the alarm that this is a problem that once again, um, we, it has to go beyond just this, these four walls here, that we need to have this community outside and specifically with our healthcare providers? Well, I can certainly appreciate that question. Um, so Celebrate One already does invest in some of those um, interventions that you're talking about, and currently they invest on a small scale, but we do plan to increase that investment over time. We have a doula gap program that um, it is a partnership with local doulas that is offered to all of our clients. Um, we also have a doula expansion program, which is what I'm particularly excited about, which actually targets the doula workforce in Central Ohio. Um, so it's a partnership with um, a teaching and training organization to help funnel um, folks who are interested in becoming doulas into an education pathway and actually physically increase the workforce in Central Ohio. Um, so we are doing some of that. We also have um, robust partnerships with the hospitals. Um, and, and you're right, we are not going to be inside a birthing hospital um, ourselves, but we do have relationships there so that the, re the communication does permeate those walls. That's not necessarily enough and we're not finished, but um, those do exist. I wanna address the um, community assessment, um, which you brought up early on in your statement. Um, I have to share that I think that that is important. Um, we have, um, I'm not proposing a citywide 
community assessment. I'm proposing a specific to the zip codes that we serve because in the 10 years that we've been at this work, the rate hasn't moved at all. Um, and so while we have proven interventions at play, I do not want to miss the voice of the community members in those zip codes who may be telling us that there are unique factors in their zip codes um, that we also need to pay attention to. Um, and, you know, Perhaps it is the fact that I've been in this role for six months, but I really do feel that it's important to go to the source and ask the question. And so that's really the intention behind the community assessment, um, because while we have heard aggregated numbers around the city, what we haven't really heard is the granularity that I believe that we need in order to move the needle. Does that answer your question? It does, and you know, the reality is that uh, black babies are dying, black mothers are dying, families are being torn apart. And so the sense of urgency, um, I feel, uh, comes back around every year when we have this specific conversation. Mm -hmm. And so I am very interested in uh, tangible solutions, actions, us walking and chewing gum at the same time doing the assessment and then also continuing to invest in strategies that have been that have proven uh, positive results as it relates to this specific community. So I'm excited for your leadership and uh, what we're going to be able to engage in um, uh, this year. But it's the commitment from I know I, can, I believe I can speak for my, my colleague Councilmember Bankston um, on this effort for us to truly lean in and really start to bring in our healthcare partners on a different level about how we really um, elevate this crisis in our community. So thank you for the additional um, information. If I might also just uh, before we move away from that, oh, it's fun. Um, but um, I also believe in this past state budget in the biennium that um, we actually did get approval for Medicaid reimbursement for doula services through the budget, through the ODM budget. Um, I know that the rules around that specifically, like the implementation of that, I believe were to be under the Ohio Board of Nursing. Mm -hmm. um, and I just don't think that's really something we're talking about and I'm not quite sure what the effective date is, but I imagine it is an effect. I, I don't wanna misquote us here though now, but um, especially again, as we're thinking about sustainability of services, we're thinking about diversifying revenue streams, we're thinking about how to like fully integrate into the community systems as we're looking at the marketing campaign that we'll be engaged in this year through the Celebrate One, mm -hmm. that might be helpful to include in our messaging. And I will um, leave it in your ex area of expertise to like do the digging on that to make sure I didn't um, say something incorrect, but. Uh, may I speak to that? Sure, yeah. Thank you. Um, so yes, we are aware of the need for um, doula reimbursement to roll up to the state nursing board. And we in fact have a staff member that sits on the doula advisory committee of that state nursing board that will help us understand. She's actually helping to kind of craft what that looks like, but we'll also bring that information back to Central Ohio to help us understand how to best um, prepare the, the doulas that we are in fact educating for that purpose. Um, there's a lot of work to be done in the space of per, professional, the, the birthing professional spectrum. So there are midwives, there are doulas, and then there are um, the healthcare professionals that are in our current healthcare system right now, which we see as ob doctors and nurses and et cetera. And I think the work ahead of us is to learn how to pull those together and make sure that there is a hand-in-hand -hand relationship. Um, so that is certainly not lost on me. Um, it's something that our hospital systems are also aware of. But it is the responsibility of Celebrate One to center that conversation and bring folks back to it repeatedly um, and also put a plan of action together around how we actually uh, implement that in a hospital system in Central Ohio. Wonderful. Thank you, Council President. Do you have anything? No. 
Thank you so much for being here. Looking forward to working with you. Um, last but certainly, certainly not least, um, Director Stevens um, and um, Assistant Director Jones, we would love um, to invite you to present about um, the community services and human services funding um, that is within the Department of Development budget. And thank you very much for your patience and um, willingness to engage with us. Thank you. Uh, good evening again, President Hardin, Chair Green, members of council. Uh, our human services operating budget is um, proposed at 10.5 million. This includes $541,000 for staff and $10 million for human service programming. Beginning in 2022, the city increased its commit commitment to human services by doubling its investment in the human services sector from 5 million to 10 million. The support for the sector continued into 2023 and, and now 2024 with the city allocating $10 million to support human service agencies. I'd like to recognize that the work of our human services team um, has taken you know, the operating budget of just 541,000 and the providing staffing and progr programmatic support needed to manage $11.5 million in project investment funding. This is project funding that is 20 times, 23 times the cost of our operations. Our Elevate program is in its second of three years. The Elevate, Elevate program is a shift from specific human service programs to investing in capacity building grants aimed at cultivating resilience and sustainability across the sector. The thought behind our strategy is to support organizations and not particular programs as we have in the past. This way we strengthen organizational capacity and encourage collaboration between grantees. We currently have 64 organizations that are funded. These organizations are focused on nine of the 21 Opportunity Arising aspirations provided, providing a range of support from homelessness assistance to infant vitality. The current group completed year one with the close of 2023 and are beginning year two in 2024. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you so much, and I very much appreciate. I know there were maybe some bumps along the road with the with the elevate, but I really appreciate the attention um, to trying to do something innovative in this space. And I think we had um, a conversation this afternoon where, you know, I think we have some work to do to um, change folks' perception about these nonprofit organizations are businesses for a social good. Um, and so trying to figure out how we can um, make sure that all of our needs across the system are being addressed is um, definitely something of interest to me. Knowing that um, we are coming to a close um, with the Elevate grants after this year, is that right? The last year... So this is the second year. We'll start an RFP process at the end of this year to go into the end of 2020. So 2025, excuse me, will represent the third and final year. We'll have an overlapping RFP process so that by the end of 2025, we're announcing. Okay. So it's a waterfall, so to speak. Lo okay, wonderful. Um, so just kind of knowing that we have that timeline, that gives us a lot of time to you know, think about um, what we've learned, I guess, through the process as we, um, you know, took a took an innovative approach to it this past round. Um, do you have a sense of um, of how we can prepare for that next funding cycle, both from a fiscal perspective and maybe how we can use our learnings from this, not just to assess outcome and how well the implementation method went, but also to um, maybe assess need as well, um, which will help guide our funding uh, in, the, in the years down the road. Sure. Uh, so we try and spend a lot of time engaging with our current grantees, engaging with our philanthropic partners. This is where our relationship with other partners like the Columbus Foundation, United Way, and the Human Services Chamber are really valuable in helping us inform what we're hearing from the community. So um, this work really reflected the first iteration of that, which was that as organizations were coming through COVID, 
that flexible cash was gone. Um, and so recognizing that we couldn't put endless resources in, how do we get the most bang for our buck and trust organizations to be able to do what they can? So I think a lot of it will be sitting with us and saying with, to our partners, is that the same place you are? Does the time frame make sense? You know, we originally went from one year to three because organizations needed stability. Um, doubling the commitment as an, as an administration, going from five to $10 million was a huge leap. I think we all know that does that need to look different? Could it look different? That'll probably be one of the biggest keys um, to the conversation. I also think it's really important to point out that our human services work really aligns with the work of our department. It aligns with the wraparound services for people on the land, people experiencing um, both homelessness, but also who come from marginalized communities that are most heavily impacted. And so how we refine that scope, um, human services is represented and supported broadly in this city. So for our department, it's really how do we continue to create that infrastructure to wrap around the families that we're working to stabilize. So that's kind of a big picture to say it's really open there, but to your point, we have a lot of lead time um, and we look forward to working closely with our chair and co-chair as well as the community on it. Um, that, yeah, that's wonderful. And then I think also, um, you know, again, this is not just a Columbus problem, the, sh the scarcity of resources, it's an everywhere problem in the United States. Um, and so kind of to that end, the city can't do it all. Um, and we can't be the only one investing in these resources. What, um, what kind of efforts of collaboration with our partners at the county are underway? Or I'm also thinking about um, our Adam board as well, you know, who has their own revenue streams specifically for these types of uh, community social support services um, to, again, I think what, what has become abundantly clear to me, it already was as a, on the provider side of thing, but sitting in this seat now for the very brief amount of time I have is that the need is so much greater um, than, than the current resources. And so we have two options, both I think we should be doing, looking for more resources and then figuring out how, how to pick up efficiencies so that we can stretch our dollars. Um, and so curious you're having conversations um, with any of our other partners about how to do that in the context of your work. Um, or, you know, definitely interested in helping to support those conversations also. So leverage is a buzzword, as is collaboration, I think in good and bad context. Um, but I think for us, it is really an effort to identify where there's holes and how can we film? So where are other dollars not stepping in? I think it's very much the same in the housing space, right? What other tools can we leverage to invest our dollars for very low income housing? It's the same in the human services space for us. Um, I think a great way that we've looked at that too is with the Franklin County and their work on the ERA program. We realized that we had a lot of ov overlapping jurisdiction. So how do we see what they can do well and put their resources towards and what can we do well um, in order to ensure that our resources can go deeper whereas theirs might be able to go wider. I would say recognizing the need where we saw value in very deep investment we've done. So with our housing stability specialists in ERA, we set a budget that was based on a living wage to staff people for two years. Does that create long-term sustainability? Not necessarily, but it is an example of trying to align our goals around equity and what we as a city believe in um, and knowing that those are critical positions that, that we need to have. Hopefully, as a community, that infrastructure becomes embedded and so it becomes value added for the next uh, resource provider to come and fill in that gap when it exists. That's the last question for me, I'll turn it over to my colleagues, but I do just again want to reiterate, um, thank you for the compassion and empathy and care and concern that you bring into this space. Um, Vice Chair, Vice President, thank you very much for sticking with us. Um, at this time, um, we are going to turn it over um, to our invited uh, speakers to share testimony um, and ask questions of any of the department's proposed operating budgets. Um, first, uh, we have Michael Corey, um, who is the executive director of the Human Services Chamber. Thanks so much for being here tonight and hanging out with us all evening. Um, we genuinely appreciate it. Welcome to 
City Hall. Thank you and congratulations on your new role as chair of the most important committee on city council. Um, sorry, council member favor, uh, you abandoned us and I won't let you forget that. That's right. Um, uh, forgive me in advance. Um, I've got a three month old and four year old at home and uh, I'm so tired I don't feel my face right now so I might forget the testimony that I'm, I'm gonna share but I'll do my best. Um, I'm gonna regret sharing that because this is being recorded. Um, so I'm gonna try to give you a quick state of the sector. Um, uh, three minutes is, is not adequate but I'll do my best and answer any questions you all have. And I'm also gonna try to forecast some things. Um, some of which you'll have heard me say, some of which you, you may not have. Um, first, ever so briefly, for the record, the Human Service Chamber is essentially a chamber of commerce for about 200 health and human services agencies operating in Franklin County. Um, as diverse in scope of services they provide as in the people that they're serving. Um, they employ 18,000 people. They have an economic impact annually in Franklin County of $2 billion. Um, but it's a very difficult time. Um, demand is up. Demand has been going up and up and up since March of 2020. We asked our folks in June how demand compared to a year prior. It was up at 92% of them. And 75% of our members said they couldn't meet that demand. We asked them again in December. 85% said demand was up from June. It's astonishing how that just keeps accelerating. We're hoping that with inflation finally easing, that the aggregate effect will finally begin to be felt by individuals and families and the demand on agencies will begin to slow or reverse. But that's gonna run up against one of the other challenges, which is our growth. Even as the percentage of people in need is going to go down, the number of people in need is going to go up. Costs are up. You've heard about that a ton today. We don't need to elaborate on that. They're up for everybody, including agencies, in terms of their operations um, to deliver the services that they need to deliver to help the community. There is tons of state and federal government instability and unpredictability. We're waiting to find out if our government's going to remain open again right now. That would have a spectacular and cascading effect on our sector and the people it serves. We, we can't be doing this, but we have no choice. Um, we're stuck in that. And at the state side, we had to fight again for the state to not ax funding to multiple sectors. And fortunately, we were able to block um, uh, a lot of the draconian cuts that had been proposed once again. Those aren't going to go away. Um, there is a funding cliff that we have been in and that we are in that is also part of that acceleration of demand. Those one-time dollars on, excuse me, from the federal government through this state, through the city, through the county, both to individuals and organizations, those have dried up or are drying up and will continue to do so, as you all know. Um, and the workforce is strained. It has been strained. It is strained in subsectors, as you've heard from your Columbus Public Health colleagues, as you heard from the Community Shelter Board. Um, it is true across our sector. And um, I did a little survey of our membership over the last five days to give you some fresh data. We got 83 responses from a really nice cross sector of the membership in terms of size. Um, we asked them, what does it look like now in terms of your recruiting and retention efforts compared to a year ago? 56% said it's about the same. 29% said it's harder. And only 7% said it's easier. Still a significant challenge. The primary challenges, you would guess, wages and benefits, 42%, and finding qualified staff, 41%. We did also ask for whatever it's worth, has your agency increased benefits and salary for your team since March of 2020? 92% have, I'm actually stunned it's not 100. And since January of last year, it was 77%. So agencies are trying, but the margins are so much thinner. And I asked our folks, what do you want me to share when I testify on Tuesday? And the recurring theme across all of them was, and again, you all know this, the costs and the demand have grown faster than the funding into the sector to pay their people to meet the demand of this community. And as you all have said, 
It is not the responsibility of one entity or body like the city of Columbus to compensate for that, but we need that continued leadership to do so. And I want to applaud your development team for working its butt off. Our sector is very fortunate to have the quartet, I think, that our sector works with. We want them to have $50 million to distribute to health and human services nonprofits for grants. And that doubling from five to 10 was a huge deal. That was the first time that it happened since the early 90s. And we want them to have even more money to distribute to our folks so those partnerships can grow and we can meet the demands of this community. Uh, quickly looking ahead, demand's not gonna stop going up um, because of the growth of our community, because of other challenges. And I was so grateful that um, Shannon Issa mentioned global warming. That is another reason demand is gonna go up. It already is. That's just another stressor on people and cost and in health consequences. We think that is intertwined with everything in our sector and will be all the more so as things accelerate. Um, the second costs are gonna keep going up because of the supply and demand challenges with housing and healthcare alone. Um, third, the state and federal government unpredictability is going to accelerate too. We can talk about why, but I think um, that one doesn't require <laughs> any elaboration. And the funding cliff, because of that, state and federal unpredictability could get a lot worse in the years ahead. Um, I mean, if we look at some of the fights they're having in Congress as we speak, the folks that, I should say, the sectors and the people served by the sector that a lot of lawmakers are, are targeting are health and human services. So we have folks fighting in real time to preserve funding levels while these negotiations continue. Um, those kinds of fights aren't going away anytime soon, but there is hope. There is a mechanism that the city has utilized in the past to identify recommendations for increasing funding to our sector and to others. We are chomping at the bit for that to get back together and identify great ideas that we can implement as quickly as possible so that we have the funding for stabilizing the sector and the community, um, knowing that we don't know and we can't control where state and federal levels might be at. Um, as a corollary to that, we know that we have cross-sector partnerships that we have really built well over the last now almost four years. And they're eager to stack hands and do this at the local level, regardless of what's happening at the State House and in Washington. So um, I, will, I will stop there, but happy to answer any questions now or later. Um, and thank you for your grace with whatever mistakes I made while I was speaking. Um, it's, I didn't get much sleep either with the toddler last night, so we're in the same book together. Indeed. Um, but uh, thank you for your testimony. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for your thoughtfulness in um, collecting that data. It's such, such a short, short last minute for us. Um, my question is, as we look to the future, trying to better understand, you know, certainly there is a need right now, but, you know, even from sitting at this point, and maybe even you as well as the head of the chamber, it's hard to identify from this vantage point as requests are coming in kind of one by one, what exactly the gap is in terms of what organizations are, what their current revenue is compared to like where are they, how much are we in the red, what, what gaps do we need to bridge, not just in services, but in stabilizing our uh, systems of care that are um, absolutely the most important tool that we have to be able to address all of the social um, challenges that we're facing as a community. Um, so, a, how do you envision us? What information do we need to be looking at collecting with our partners around the community um, in order to make sure that we're going forward with some strategy? Um, yeah, thanks for that. So uh, first, let me say, I remember having this conversation with Councilmember Tyson when I was brand new on the job uh, in 2017 when the enormity of grant applications in terms of money requested was three times what was available. Mm -hmm. We're in the same general boat, although I would imagine the proportions are a little bit different. The prospects for Columbus are different and better than they were in 2017 um, and so forth. I've bought myself enough time to answer your question now. Um, I think that the, the 
kind of information gathering that you're wanting us to tease out will require um, a combination of hard conversations, surveys, incorporating the community, um, getting a full sense of what could it look like um, to adequately fund the way that we were able to do for chunks of 2020 and 2021 because there was so much voluminous money available that had to be spent fast relative to now where those dollars are either gone or about to be where we've arrived at some semblance of an equilibrium in terms of what dollars might be available um, but we still have all this uncertainty on where demand is going to be at and I think that's part of the hard part of your question. Even if we asked everybody in the sector and around the sector today, um, independent of the amount that, that is available, if there was a blank check, I still think it would be difficult to pinpoint figures because of the number of moving parts. Because if a decimal point gets moved on the Fed side, then the local allotment and what nonprofits would need to do would adjust. Um, if certain people elected, certain things could go awry drastically once again, and we would have to figure things out in a way that we aren't currently having to deal with. Um, all that said, it's easier to do subsector by subsector, and some subsectors are better equipped today to answer those kinds of questions than others are for various reasons. And then we compile those subsector assessments in conjunction with the city, the county, and key funders outside of the governmental and philanthropic sectors, and we devise a funding plan over the next 10 years um, to, to, uh, to uh, address the challenges that we're seeing. Um, some of the pieces don't have an easy resolution. There aren't enough healthy people that want to work in the nonprofit workforce. We can't fix that. Um, even if we uh, suddenly had Melinda Gates come in and give us a billion dollars to spend just on nonprofit salaries. Um, because there wouldn't even be enough housing for all those people to, to, um, <laughs> to live in. Um, so there, that's a long way of saying this can be done. No community has figured it out yet. Why not us? Um, I, think it's, I think it's doable. It's going to require alignment um, of urgency and of actually seeing all of this through across sectors. And the, the, the difficulty with that is it also requires overcoming what happens at levels of government that are not as amenable to these issues. Um, well, I th and I also just want to acknowledge too, as we you know, imagine what it might look like to enter into that process, that as a nonprofit organization seeking funding from any institution, you're expected to state some level of stability, right, in your Absolutely. financial records, right? So, so I think it's also important that we be mindful of that as we're entering into this process, too, to make sure that, you know, this is like an open dialogue we want to have with the community about how we invest in human infrastructure. No one, no one ever questions not being able to repair a bridge, right? And what, but we're talking about people um, and in making meaningful investments in that infrastructure. So I look forward to joining you on that work. Did you all have any other questions? No, just thank you. If I may briefly to that, Council Member um, Chair Green, excuse me. Um, when the American Rescue Plan dollars were first allocated, um, your colleagues here and at the county asked us what were our general priorities for the city with those, with those funds, knowing that there were a million and one ways in which those dollars could be spent. And we said people, programs, and infrastructure. And that is still the general, um, uh, those are still the general categories that we advise on, um, on, on anyone's consideration with resources that are available because it is all intertwined. And um, obviously there are some subsectors that have more dramatic needs right now because the people they're serving have more acute challenges right now. Um, and those investments benefit the whole sector too. I, I, I think it's important to say that. Um, so we look forward to working together with urgency going forward and appreciate the time to talk tonight. Thank you so much. Um, next, we will transition to um, Elizabeth Brown. Welcome back to City Hall, um, the executive director of our YWCA here in Columbus. Welcome back. Hello. 
Um, Chair Green, Council President Hardin, Council Member Favor, um, thank you for allowing me to add um, to the discussion here tonight from the point of view of uh, a social service provider. Um, as you know, over the past few years, employers have faced unprecedented challenges that have sort of reshaped the landscape of the professional world. Employers everywhere grapple with an economy reshaped by COVID-19, and then we're also now facing issues like talent retention, recruitment in a competitive job market, and the ongoing need for innovation in response to changing dynamics of the workforce. As uh, Mr. Corey um, is always so crystal clear on his message, there is no employer sector more challenged than our nonprofit organizations, especially those like YWCA Columbus, who provide shelter and childcare services. Um, I am president and CEO of YWCA Columbus. YWCA Columbus is a social justice organization with a clarion mission, eliminating racism and empowering women. We operate emergency shelter, permanent supportive housing, and 22 childcare sites. We don't do any of that without the people that we employ. The dedicated individuals who work on the front lines of our shelters and childcare centers commit their lives to serving some of the most vulnerable members of our society. And in the year since I started as president and CEO of YWCA, their needs have been absolutely urgent to address. We exist to serve our clients, but we don't serve our clients without our employees. Our employees witness firsthand the struggles and hardships faced by the people we serve, and that is an emotional weight. They stay because it is hard work, but passion alone cannot support a family, and they're underpaid. In, uh, in the last year, we, we started having, having listening circles across all of our sites where employees could come and feel very safe, uh, not to talk about an exact workplace issue, but to show up as them, their whole selves and talk to us about what they're dealing with when they come to work and while they're at work, right? The 360 degree view of a person. And that right there really did, as you said, Chair Green, the cost of doing business has increased, right? The cost of providing benefits and health care um, and competitive wages. But those stories and understanding the needs of our employees um, were, again, presented as the most urgent thing we had to fix. I'm very proud that as of uh, December 15th, we raised wages across our workforce. We took that plunge. Um, we raised all full-time workers to a minimum of $20 an hour following the city's leadership. Uh, we raised part-time workers, which primarily uh, work in our school-age childcare programs, to $17 an hour. Fair wages are not just a matter of economic security for our employees, but they are a recognition of the value these individuals bring to our community and they're just plain good business sense. Because at the end of the day, nonprofits are running a business for the, for the profit of a better social good rather than a, a, a better bottom line. So pro by providing fair compensation, we support our individuals and their families, and we attract and retain top talent in the nonprofit sector. And if I could um, say for a moment about that talent in our sector, the committee um, you all have rightly renamed to have an equity focus. The people who propel our organization forward, and I dare I say probably most of the nonprofit sector, but I know at YWCA, are black women. Black women are those who are on the front lines of the services that we deliver. And we have frankly built a system with a false price tag about what it takes to provide this social good. And that price tag is based on underpaying the largely African-American women who are doing the work. Because you've created the space to talk about equity and human services, I think it's very important to make sure we highlight that. And I'm a big believer in the good that this building can deliver for our community and the problems that you are trying to solve here. Nonprofits are at the forefront of addressing those same most critical social issues that our, that our city faces. 
And by supporting these organizations, I think we can effectively extend the reach and impact of the city's efforts to create positive change. The last thing I want to note is that um, as a nonprofit, one of the thing, one thing that's hard to do is, is the wage increases that we were in a position to do today, but that we always worry. The future is not guaranteed in nonprofit work. We always worry that the other shoe is going to drop. Are we going to be able to fund this down the line? And that is why um, really linking arms with our partners in the sector and with all of you as um, our public representatives to find ways for um, robust and um, most importantly, sustainable long-term funding. Long-term sustainable. It's exceedingly important. So thank you for the opportunity to address you here tonight. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I know in addition to the hourly wage conversations we're having with the minimum hourly wage, um, there is also a larger conversation about workforce pathways um, and career pathways. Um, are you guys looking at how to address not just the minimum wage at YWCA, but also the issue of wage compression um, between your higher level workers or, um, and um, best practices for how we can think about that as well, especially in the context of the CSB request or others that are coming through? Well, I'm always looking for advice on that front because we, we essentially live um, knowing that some of our um, that a lot of our talent can be uh, hired elsewhere, especially in the private sector, or sometimes at larger nonprofits, but especially in the private sector, can just be hired elsewhere for a lot more. Um, and in the, the wage increases that we did, we really focused on um, uh, our lowest wage earners. Uh, so anyone under um, you know, 50,000 who were on the front lines uh, were beneficiaries of sort of an equity adjustment. Uh, we have not figured out uh, the rest of the puzzle, and it's a really good one. I appreciate you bringing that up, council member, because we, we, it does take um, a lot of, um, takes a lot of hands on deck um, to help make sure that our operations run smoothly and that we can continue to really thrive and succeed as a nonprofit. Um, and it's very hard to pay competitively all the way um, up and down the, the wage scale. Add it to the list for our <laughs> planning process. Um, Council President, Council Member Fever. No, just okay. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, last presenter before we do some um, public comment. Apologies, I know we're way behind schedule. Um, this is, uh, we are uh, welcoming uh, Katie White, Executive Director of COAAA. Thank you so much for being here and for hanging in. Good evening, council members. Thank you for having me. Um, I had put together slides and I rewrote my speech back there because, you know, I had some time on my hands and I thought I better reflect actually some of the topics we've been speaking about today. So, um, again, my name is Katie White. I'm the director of the Central Ohio Area Agency on Aging, which actually is a um, city entity. So we are under the Rec and Parks Department. Uh, we have a federal mission and mandate to support individuals as they navigate aging, disability, and caregiving services. And we are regionally focused, uh, we serve an eight county region, on planning, advocacy, funding, and providing home and community-based services. And so while the home and community-based services are obviously why we are in the Human Services and Equity uh, Committee, we also have a huge portion of our work in housing. And lack of housing is a direct threat to our ability to do our home and community-based services. So I wanted to just share a few things um, that we are either recent, that we've recently launched or planning to launch as it relates to housing and equity. So Council President Hardin, you talked about being on the front line um, and how that secondary trauma um, and that emotional toll is so serious. And my colleagues at COAAA, we do that every day, whether we're in the homes, whether we're in the low-income housing complexes, whether we're on the phones uh, taking the calls for individuals that don't have a place to go. Um, we live and breathe and lead in that space day in and day out, um, for better or for worse. It's not necessarily a space that we want to be in all the time, but we are there. Um, so, and, so I want you to know the 
level of expertise and um, clinical excellence that really we provide to those community members in those times of need. So in reflection, um, I just wanted to share a little bit about equity. Uh, so when you think about an older adult, um, you probably know that there is cumulative disadvantage. So over the lifetime, um, and a really good example of that is if you are unhoused and older um, and you have needs with activities of daily living, you actually aren't allowed to go into a shelter. Um, and I have worked with Executive Director Isam around this conversation, and again, it's not you unique here, but I don't think anybody ever anticipated that our older adults or people with disabilities would be unhoused. And so um, we also need to be at the forefront of working on that. Um, and at COAAA, we really are. We're looking at the needs. We're prepping for growth. We're innovating. Um, one way to understand the holistic needs of those that we serve is that we are getting into some predictive analytics. So we've created a social determinants of health screening tool um, that we are deploying across our programs to understand the comprehensive needs of those we serve, and then using those results to target interventions to those most at risk. Um, so one of those new interventions that we're working on will be looking at individuals that are paying more than 50% of their income on housing, which makes them extremely cost burdened. They may or may not know that they're facing a crisis soon, um, but we can use that data to empower us to reach out proactively and hopefully prevent the crisis that might be coming. Uh, we know that crises will continue, and so we will continue what we are doing, which is our housing assistance program, which helps with rent, down payments, utilities, and things like that. Um, and then we'll continue to be that advocacy voice in uh, partnerships such as the Franklin County Auditor's Office and their property tax assistance program. To Council Member Favor's point earlier, we are absolutely working with homeowners uh, whose property taxes are increasing and who put them at risk for losing their housing. And then to wrap things up, just wanted to share that we're also really research and evidence-based focused. And so we're working with the Age-Friendly Innovation Center at Ohio State's College of Social Work, um, not only on statistically valid regional survey results, which we've made public through a interactive um, dashboard. Anyone can utilize that data to write grants to show their needs uh, for individuals 60 and older. Working with OSU's Geropsychology Department, um, and we, I'm not sure if you remember this last year, but COAAA and City Council co-funded a study with the Age Friendly Innovation Center around older adults and emergency preparedness for severe weather events. And so they are in the buildings, they are hosting focus groups, they are doing surveys with older adults and people with disabilities to understand what do you need, where are you getting your information, what worked during the heat emergency, what did you have and what didn't work. And so those results, um, while they'll be very harrowing, I think will be extremely important in those next steps and conversations. So finally, um, again, just want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to share the incredible work of the 385 staff members of the Central Ohio Area Agency on Aging, uh, to thank you for your crucial funding that acts as our match to the federal funds that we need to draw down, um, and to humbly ask that we are involved in the conversations um, as you move forward in all of your work to ensure that aging and disability lens is on all future plans. Thank you. Happy to answer questions. Thank you so, so very much for being here. And also thank you for um, updating your uh, remarks so that it was really responsive to the conversation that we had today because I think it was really meaningful to kind of hear about your services also just kind of in alignment with the other issues that are really prescient prescient right now. Um, and I also think, you know, you really highlighted some of the um, some of the gaps in services, like the, the housing challenges for unhoused um, folks who are also elderly. Um, and so I think I don't really have any questions um, for you at this time, but I do want to say, you know, uh, I started kind of this section of our, uh, our HHSE work out by saying, you know, it's well known, the governor talks about how the system is not broken, the system wasn't built, and you can kind of see along the way we are, um, we are trying to kind of drive the car, you know, as we're also putting the pieces together and the steering wheel's not quite right and the engine's not quite propelling us forward in a particular direction. And so um, looking forward to being able to work with not just you, but everyone that's here tonight to figure out how uh, we can both address the needs that exist today while also thinking through and being thoughtful about um, where we go from here 
uh, for the future. So thank you. Anything from you? No. Thank, thank you, you so much. again. And I will um, turn it back over to uh, Chair Favor. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Green. All right. We know that the hour is late, and so we appreciate your patience as we navigate through this new process this evening. Uh, we're going to move towards the public testimony portion of the agenda. Uh, we have approximately nine speakers uh, that are here to speak. Uh, you will have three minutes uh, to speak. At the end of the three minutes, there will be a very polite and respectful ding to let you know that your time has concluded. Please state your name and any organization that you might represent. Up first, we have Wade Biglin, who will be followed by Sonia Thiesing. Welcome back to council, sir. Thank you, uh, President Hardin, Chair Green, Chair Favor, um, for giving us this time to speak here. Um, firstly, I apologize for my appearance. I'm looking very casual. Um, I came direct from one of our service events uh, right here. Um, the first thing I'd, I'd love to discuss, uh, I see something that is a bit glaring to me that perhaps was a bit overlooked here. Um, we discussed earlier uh, our housing budget and the proposed increase. Um, some of the items that we see on our budget don't reflect what maybe we were talking about today. Um, I know I see there is about a four million proposed decrease in our housing on the general funds budget. Uh, overall, our development budget goes down about six million, but we were shared that uh, that 19 percent increase is what we're possibly seeing for our housing uh, and homelessness. Oh, and I'm sorry, my name is uh, Wade Biglin. I'm with Make-A-Day, uh, a social services organization here. I'm actually one of our housing resource specialists there and have been living and breathing housing as much as I can for the past three years. Uh, so a little background on me. Um, the 19% number, let's uh, assume that is correct. I would love to see the numbers behind that. But assuming uh, with that number of 19% increase, uh, what we learned from the community shelter board from our point in time uh, count increase is that that number was at 22%. That was over a year ago. Uh, our new point in time count is going to be uh, at the end of this month. So if we take that 19% increase while assuming that we need a 22% increase in the amount of people that need these services, and that's over a year ago, I think it's a really big discrepancy that I'm seeing uh, and actually appears to constitute a decrease in our funding if we run the numbers there. Uh, I'm not a CPA or anything, but it seems if we have that much more need and only that percentage of increase, uh, it does appear to me that we're, we're really doing a disservice by framing that as an increase when in fact it's going to make it harder. Uh, we already know that those numbers are going up uh, based on the numbers we're seeing from the point in time count as well as the services being utilized in the city. Uh, so I think going a step backwards in the direction is really not gonna have the effect uh, that we need it to have. I really urge that we should be looking at the increase going much further beyond that 19%, uh, making up for the inflation that we're seeing these years, making up for a lot of the other factors that are actually, like I said, uh, realistically constituting a decrease in the amount of services per capita that we have for our individuals. Um, I'll concede the rest of my time, and thank you so much uh, for all of your discussion here today. We do truly appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Biglin, and I love the shirt. Thank I you. do too. <laughs> um, <laughs> Director Stevens, I'm gonna um, turn that question over to you to respond to uh, Mr. Biglin, if you have any a response. Uh, yeah, so what I, I can share is what the general operating budget dollars for 2023 for our housing division, the amount that is going to be in that for 2024 is 19% higher than um, the previous year. A lot of that's driven by the 10 additional positions that are gonna be included in the division. Um, there was a discrepancy in the budget book where the, and the right now those 10 positions are actually housed in the administration line item of the budget, even though those are housing uh, positions, and that's where we'll get that correct and that funding for the housing division will be there. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Bigham, for your testimony and your patience this evening. Uh, next, we have uh, Ms. Sonia Thiesing, then will be followed by Amy Claben. Welcome back to council. Good evening, President Hardin, Chair Green, and Chair Favor. Um, thank you for having us this evening. My name is Sonia Thiesing, and I serve as the Executive Director of Huckleberry House, a beacon of hope and safe haven in our community, providing shelter, support, and guidance to young people facing difficult situations. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and share about our work and highlight the importance of investing in programs that prevent homelessness. Each year, there are 3,000 youth ages 18 to 24 who experience homelessness in our city. Even one night on the streets puts youth at risk. Every night a young person is unhoused results in a 2% increase in the likelihood of returning to homelessness after secure ha securing stable housing. Should a young person experience homelessness for 25 days, they are 50% more likely to become homeless again in the future. That's where Huck House comes in. We have served the community with compassion, integrity, and respect for more than 50 years, playing a unique and integral role as the only teen crisis shelter in Central Ohio for un unaccompanied minors who have run away, been kicked out, or do not feel safe at home. Our services work to address the root issues that cause youth homelessness and provide at-risk youth with resources to support, heal, recover, and grow. We provide a continuum of services for youth ages 12 to 24, including our teen crisis shelter. We were fortunate to receive funding support from the city in fiscal 22-23 for the crisis shelter, and we appreciate the commitment the city has shown to supporting our work, particularly the efforts of council member favor. These investments supported our tailored one-on-one -on -one care with youth to address their individual challenges, and it has provided a high return on investment for the city. Research demonstrates that investment in homelessness prevention programs reduce local government spending across medical and behavioral health care systems, criminal and legal systems, and publicly funded wraparound services. Huckleberry House is facing a critical inflection point for the future of funding of the crisis shelter, a trusted and safe place in our community that provides shelter, necessities, and counseling to youth ages 12 to 17. We urge council to act on this need. Our crisis shelter is a lifeline for teens in our city who need a safe, trusted space to seek shelter, support, and community. At the heart of these programs are trusted, compassionate staff members who care deeply about the safety, well-being, and success of those we serve. Our efforts make a difference in the lives of youth facing difficult circumstances. Last year, 92% of youth served through the crisis shelter returned to safe and appropriate housing, and 87% of youth in housing programs attended school, graduated, and or held jobs. The city funding allocated to Huck House was integral to the success of this work. We re respectfully request an allocation in the fiscal 24-25 budget of $150,000 to Huckleberry House, demonstrating the continued dedication to keeping young people safe and off the streets. These dollars would go towards the operational needs of the crisis shelter, from staffing to small capital improvements to program expenses. By supporting our work, you can help make sure our teen crisis shelter remains open and welcoming for all young people who need a safe place, stopping homelessness before it happens. Budgets are a demonstration of values. We must remain committed to young people facing seemingly insurmountable challenges that put them at risk of experiencing homelessness. These are our kids. Their success is our community's collective success story. Huck House is a foundational part of that story, and we ask this committee to consider the immense impact that city funding can have on the future of our work and the lives of our city's youth. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Are there any questions by my colleagues? Okay. Thank you for your continued you. partnership and the work you do on behalf of our, our young folks in our community. And next we have Amy Claben. She will be followed by Noelle Williams and then Emily Myers. Welcome back to council. Thank you very much, Chair Favor, President Hardin, Chair Green. My name is Amy Claben, and I'm the president and CEO of Families Flourish, formerly known as Move to Prosper. Before that, I ran Homeport for 16 and a half years and built more than 3,000 affordable housing units during my tenure. 
I want to tell you a little bit about our program, but there's no better demonstration of our work than what our participants say. The disruption of generational patterns. When I think about the future, I think about generational wealth, and I'm not talking about wealth. I'm talking about wisdom, respect, and kindness. I want that for my daughter, and Families Flourish is providing that. Another mom said, if you want to support a woman, if you want to support children having access to a safer neighborhood, it just checks so many boxes. And another, I'm back to school for health care because I have the stable housing that allows me the brain space to do it. I'm here today to humbly ask for budget funding for our program, which crosses human services and housing affordability. The mission of Families Flourish is to create a more equitable community for families by empowering them to achieve and succeed through a holistic support initiative. Families Flourish was created as an initiative with faculty in the city and regional planning program at The Ohio State University with community members and organizations from across central Ohio. Our 10 family pilots successfully helped families raise their incomes an average of 58% or $17,000. The OSU researchers found that the key was first to remove toxic stress by enabling parents to have the opportunity to access healthy homes in safer neighborhoods, and then they can engage in the required coaching and programs. Parents are provided tools to improve life outcomes for them, themselves and their children through monthly programs. Life coaches, coaching focuses on financial literacy, life skills, and job and career advancement, health and wellness, and access to quality education for children. Families are also provided tools to, to achieve financial capacity, housing stability, and affordability through rent support. The program deeply invests with families, spending three years alongside them on their journey. And importantly, we address what Council Member Remy articulated to Columbus Metropolitan Club last week. Affordable housing cannot solely be the problem for the city of Columbus. The entire region has to solve it together. And as Director Stevens said earlier, the regional coalition the city is working on will create access to housing and opportunity. We are doing this today by providing rental support. Families Flourish helps communities embrace and create housing that's accessible to all. We partner with landlords in central Ohio to allow families to access healthy homes and our rental support allows them to afford a safer neighborhood. After being admitted into the program, 29 of our 47 families who are currently in the program live in the city of Columbus. We request consideration for $100,000 from the human services budget to support our coaching and programs for our families who reside in Columbus. Additionally, we request $100,000 from the housing budget to help with rental support for our Columbus residents. I will end with one last comment from one of our participants. She said, this program is such a blessing. Thank you for your consideration, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Claben. Any questions by my colleagues? I have one quick question. Um, th this would be the first time that you have requested funding from the city, is that right? Yes, for it this, is. For this work, and then what what kind of percentage of your budget would those requests be constitute? I think it's about 15%. Okay. Yeah, I don't have that exact amount, okay. but about that. But not like a, it wouldn't be a majority of the cost. And um, how many people would you be able to serve with that expansion of funds? Oh, thank you. Um, so we're currently, we have our applications open by the end of March. We'll have 65 families, which represents 165 people served. We, with additional funding, will have another um, application round in the fall for another 18 families. That will bring us up to 83 families with 210 uh, people being served. 
We do not bring on additional families till we have all of the funds committed for their full three years in the program. So we don't have families who are left you know, in a bind without the rental support and the coaching for their three years. Thank you so much. That was all for me. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you, Ms. Clavin. I uh, believe Noel Williams, did she leave? That's not Noel. Noel had to leave for work, so I'm her stand in. Okay. Okay. Uh, my name is Rosemary Williams, and I'm on the Bread Organization's Housing Committee along with Noel. We want to applaud the City Council for the millions of dollars allocated last year for emergency rental assistance and affordable housing. More is needed. In fact, some of the remaining American Rescue Plan dollars could be utilized in rehabilitating old hotels and motels into affordable housing, as shown by research from the Community Shelter Board. We've been watching what has happened to residents in Colonial Village and Latitude 525, and we're here today because there are people who will sleep on the streets tonight or in a tent or in a car because housing is just too expensive. This is unacceptable, as many of you know. Our focus is on families that make less than $30,000 a year. We know that you agree with us that these people need affordable housing too. What will it take to have Columbus allocate $30 million of the remaining rescue plan dollars toward affordable housing for these residents? Thank you. And if you want, I can give my speech or do I need to come back? It's only a minute. Oh, you, you're, you're trying to do double duty. <laughs> yeah, I am doing double, because she had to go to work, so. Okay, so once again, I'm Rosemary Williams and I'm on the housing committee. And I have a different focus. Our focus, as you know, is on families that make less than $30,000 a year. We know that you agree with us that they need affordable housing too. So I was kind of surprised when I looked at the Department of Development's city housing budget had decreased for 2024. Housing in 2021 was almost 8 million, 22 it was almost 8 million, it was 8.5 million in 23, and then in 24 it was down to 4.6 million. So I was kind of surprised that it went sort of backwards. Can you tell us why that happened? Also, can you tell us if more funding for housing for people earning $30,000 a year or less will be included in the upcoming capital improvements budget? Uh, I'm going to direct those questions to uh, the administration um, that's represented by um, Director Stevens. Thank you, President Harden, Chair Favor, members of council. Um, I, I don't, un I, not having the line items in front of me, what I can share is um, we are making a significant num uh, investment in the number of new employees uh, in the housing division which is going to significantly increase the budget amount for the housing division. Um, we are working through our capital budget work and we anticipate uh, submitting as part of the 24 capital budget a uh, request for $50 million again this year for affordable housing projects. Is that, can I ask a question? Is that bond money or is that American Rescue Plan money? Uh, that is the funding through the uh, voted appro voter, voter approved bonds. Okay, so it's still nothing on ARPA. Um, what I can continue to share and, and, and happy to, and I know that we've continued to provide this information, we have um, invested using federal funds um, around housing of close to $100 million. Um, I rounded up, probably fair to stay at an $80 million number um, around some of our federal dollars that have come in post-COVID as a result of that. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Williams, for your testimony okay. this evening. Next, we have Emily Myers. Please let the record reflect. Deborah Crawford. Followed by Drew Bat, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, 
Hello, thank you for this opportunity to speak. I know you're all tired, so um, I'll try to be brief. My name's Deborah Crawford, I live in Clintonville. I'm, I'm mostly here because I went to the Columbus Metropolitan Luncheon, uh, Luncheon last week on homelessness. Uh, and if you haven't had a chance to see the, the video of it, it's worth it. I think it would be very enlightening. A recent dispatch, uh, also I have had a long career in public health and social work. A recent dispatch article had the headline, Brace Yourself, Sub-Zero Wind Chill and Snow Coming. Currently we have lots of people at many highway exits and we have families in grocery store parking lots begging for help. But then some of us have gotten used to that, haven't we? Um, just brace yourselves. Will we eventually get used to people standing at the end of our driveways begging for help? My husband and I have been concerned about the homeless, affordable housing and eviction crises for years. We volunteered and we've done what we can in terms of donating. We befriended a man named Ken living in his car in Whetstone Park. A young friend, of, and he's been sleeping on the street and in his car on all these terrible nights. A young friend of ours is on disability and she can't afford rent. She's been living in a rundown camper with no running water on an illegal lot. Our newly divorced friend had trouble finding a decent place to live on his not so bad retirement income. Closing the affordable housing gap is going to take a very long time, probably many years. And that's if our community leaders actually find the will to do it. And again, I recommend to you the Columbus Metropolitan Lunch uh, video if you haven't seen it. Until we close the affordable housing gap, homelessness will continue to rise in Columbus. And you're right, Councilwoman Green, it's a national issue. Comparable communities in, like Minneapolis, Charlotte, and Austin have invested far more heavily in housing than we have. Please support the big Columbus community movers and shakers, very wealthy people that have lots, growing their investment in solutions to homelessness while the affordable housing gap is being addressed. I urge you to support the Community Shelter Board's request for increased funding to address homelessness. For just one example, we must have more warnings, warming centers. If you look at the list of warming centers, it's pathetic, it really is. And the 24 hour and nighttime hours are hardly existent. Today's my birthday. In 10 years, I'll be 78. What will we see on the streets of Columbus in 2034? Will it, it will be a reflection of the decisions that we all make now today as a community, and especially that our city and our community, community leaders make. You are our leaders and our policymakers. You have power and influence. We're counting on you. I want to thank you, your staff, for all you do. We know it's not easy. Until we close the affordable housing gap, homelessness will only get worse. Um, yes, this is a national crisis. I urge you to support the Community Shelter Board's request for funding. I thank you for what you do. And I ask you to take good care of yourselves because it's a long haul and meeting like, meetings like this <laughs> are crazy. So <laughs> thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, um, happy birthday to a fellow Capricorn yes. um, as well. A, a, and social worker. Um, thank you for your testimony um, this evening and, and point as well taken. Hopefully, um, if tonight's four-hour uh, marathon meeting demonstrates our um, commitment to um, working collectively with the Community Shelter Board as well as with the Department of Development to uh, um, ensure we are meeting the moment. Um, we failed to do that this past weekend, uh, but um, what we have learned this evening is that there are opportunities and other levers that are in place uh, that are going to um, help to ensure that um, we don't miss the mark again. And so uh, that is nothing to um, ease the hearts of those who are facing this cold weather today or for someone like yourself who cared so deeply about this issue that you spent four hours on your birthday uh, to be here, but just know that this is top of mind uh, for a strong housing advocate like myself. 
So thank you for being here tonight. Chair Favor, can I add one, one thing real quick? Um, earlier today when I was giving, when I was talking about the situation that I, that I explained from yesterday, I kind of, I, I like this story and I like what I experienced because it really did spread around and showed like system wide, like little opportunities for us to get better. Specifically around warming centers though, I don't want us to lose this. The community has some responsibility too and why we don't have more warming centers. Neighbors have some responsibility. Us, when we say we need to be challenged, it's not just government issues why we don't have more warming centers. It's hard and neighbors want, just like affordable housing, they want the idea of warming centers but just not near me. And so as I spread this around, how we all need to do better, we need to think about how we challenge ourselves as individual residents because the emails that we got last year, the phone calls that we got last year from I'm sure really good Columbus residents who probably would really support keeping folks out of, you know, sub-zero temperatures except when it was in their neighborhood is that's we can't fix that that's a individual um columbus resident issue and how we can be better neighbors as well Well, we will, we will certainly take uh, advice. It is something that this council supports is more warming centers and working with the shelter board. Uh, but, but we would, would certainly like to add more. We just have to figure that out as a community. Yeah, it's, it's definitely not lost on us. NIMBYism is a problem, whether we're talking about affordable housing or um, this specific issue around warming centers. Uh, in fact, one of the reasons why we lost one last year was because of NIMBYism. It is a problem in our community that we have got to face um, head on. So thank you for uh, broaching that conversation. And just, you know, if I could sprinkle a little empathy in there, let's not wait until the issue is right in front of our face before we want to latch on to it, that we get out there and start being advocates uh, even before it's literally in our backyard. So once again, happy birthday to you, Ms. Crawford. Uh, next we have Drew Bat, Bate, Bat. Last but certainly not least, Ms. Bethany Sanders. Welcome back to council. Good evening. And thank you all so much for taking the time this evening. It was very educational for me to listen to the witnesses um, throughout the day. My name is Bethany Sanders, and I am the Director of Policy and Strategic Initiatives for Franklin County Auditor Michael Stinziano. Um, we've heard a couple references to property taxes throughout this, e this evening. Um, and to just put it in stark terms, there are 159,100 owner-occupied homes in the Franklin County portion of Columbus. Of those, 27% or 42,000 households are seeing an increase of more than $1,000 in their annual property tax bill, the first installment of which is due January 31st. The bills for this did not go out until the end of December. This is a fundamental flaw in our property tax system to not have any relief for those who, due to the market, become house rich and cash poor, and especially with the timing of when the appraisal is done, when the levies are passed, and when the bills go out. We saw a 41% increase countywide in residential property, but we saw individual pockets that experienced 100%, 200% increases in their property. Because of how tight the housing market has become, so many of these areas are areas that have been historically underinvested in. Milo Grogan, Near East, Linden, Franklinton, Hilltop, are all areas that we're seeing some of these starkest, steepest increases for traditionally more affordable homes and homeowners that often have the least ability to suddenly weather this increase in their budget. 
Not only is this a regional issue, it is certainly an issue that should be best addressed at the state level. It is something that the General Assembly has failed to address, despite many advocating that they do so. Until such time as they manage to do that, and there are many policy solutions that they could embrace for this purpose, we in the auditor's office, who received 4,000 calls last week from residents countywide who are confused, questioning, angry, and panicked about what is going to happen to their home, uh, we want local governments like the city of Columbus to see if they can balance the very critical priorities that we heard today to find some ability to provide direct relief. We are going to see an increase in delinquent property taxes. We are going to see people feel pressure to sell their home without a plan, to sell their home to someone who will take advantage of them. And we want to give time to these homeowners to weather this storm a little bit and to find a solution. That has almost nothing to do with what I've written down, but I'm happy to answer any questions now or at a time of convenience to any of the council members. Thank you, uh, Ms. Sanders. Uh, any council members? I was just wondering, is this something that, is this, is this conversation one that is being had at the county as well? Uh, yes, President Hardin. We so, were sharing the same information with, uh, with county leadership, with county commissioners, and would, would frankly similarly hope that entities like the city of Columbus, like Franklin County as a whole, like most of the cities and townships, would look at the budget increase they're receiving from the inside millage, which for the city, city of Columbus is about $18 million in general fund revenue, uh, and, and think about how that revenue stream that's directly related to the reappraisal could be used for this purpose. So we'd love to see matching in partnership, and we'd love to see someone like the city of Columbus, which has the most residents impacted, um, join us in, in leadership on this. Thank you. Um, do you have, or can you send over, um, uh, any information that you have of other locations, municipalities that have approached this issue from different uh, perspectives and what maybe best practices if we were to look at doing something like this might be or what the possibilities might be? So Chair Green, there really has not been any action on this at a city uh, or township level within Central Ohio. Other counties have done across the board property tax cuts, yeah. primarily, um, which we don't like as a policy matter because it, it, it's not need-based and it's incredibly expensive to reach yeah. where, you, where you like. Just like so many things throughout the last three years, there was a backstop to this because there was a state-level program through OFA, the Save the Dream program, which provided funding for both mortgage and property tax relief. And we've not seen these level of increase. And so it's not, it is a problem that is been slowly rising as, a, as an urgent moment that in this last year has really come to a full boil. So we have ideas and what other states do, and I will absolutely send information to your office. Yeah. We don't have great in-state or regional examples yet. Yeah, that's, I, that's fine. I think just any, any best practices, because it seems like there could be any number of ways you would approach that, like in terms of collecting whatever the previous tax was, but like having a stay on the increase or, you know, a payment yeah. plan or, you know, I definitely want to learn more. I'm very, very much uneducated in this space. Absolutely. And I'll say national best practices are that you tie the amount of relief to a, po a portion of someone's income. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you think about if you're paying more than 5% of your income in property taxes, that's kind of how you tie relief. I think locally we could also think about what the change has been mm -hmm. to do a combination of, of income portion and maxim maximum amount related to the mm -hmm. recent change. Yeah. Ms. Sanders, if uh, residents have questions about their property taxes, uh, solutions that are available through your office, where can they go? Absolutely. Um, you can reach us at 614-525-HOME, H-O-M-E, 4663. We are doing our best to staff up our, our phone line, so the whole time should be less this week than it was last week. Um, Auditor Stenziano at franklincountyohio.gov. Um, and there's a lot of information on our website, franklincountyauditor.com. Thank you, Ms. Sanders. Absolutely. Thank you all. Um, and thank you all uh, for your patience uh, this evening. Uh, Council President, do you have any final remarks? Council Member Green? All right. Well, thank you to our departments that have presented tonight and provided us with the details of their proposed 2024 budgets. I also like to thank all of the directors and their staffs, as well as Council's Legislative Research Office, Director Erickson, and the entire staff at CTV 
for their work to prepare for and hosting this hearing. I'd also like to thank my staff, um, Councilmember Green's staff. We are so incredibly proud of the work we have accomplished this year, but as always, the work is not done. I look forward to continuing the work around affordable housing, homelessness, public safety, racial equity, health and human services, um, celebrate one. The next budget hearing will take place tomorrow at 5.30 p.m. here in council chambers and will be focused on public safety and criminal justice and judiciary. Uh, before I adjourn, I'd like to take this moment, thank our residents who have joined us today and uh, who are turning in. We would, we would not be the great city. We are without each of you. And so thank you for pushing forward, for advocating for the things you believe in and for caring for one another along the way. This will now conclude tonight's evening. Have a wonderful and safe drive home.